committee meeting January 11th, 2022 to order at 7.02 p.m. This meeting is being held remotely as an alternate means of public access pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021, temporarily amending certain provisions of the open meeting law. You are hereby advised that this meeting and all communications during this meeting may be recorded by the town of Hingham in accordance with the open meeting law. If any participant wishes to record this meeting, please notify the chair at the start of the meeting in accordance with Mass General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 20F, so that the chair may inform all other participants of said recording. Is anyone else recording the meeting this evening? Hearing no one. Next on the agenda, are there comments from the public regarding items not on the agenda? Okay, seeing none. Now we will begin our budget hearings for the evening. So I see that Andrea Young has been able, uh, has joined. So we can get yes. started with preservation. Hi, Andrea. Oh, Hi, Andrea. Yeah. thank you very much. I'm just um, getting my video going here and then, ah, there we go. And there Kevin's he is. Hey. Kevin's iPhone, is that Kevin Burke? Kevin, yeah, that's Kevin Burke, my okay. chairman. All right. So shall I proceed, Julie? Yes. Yeah, oh, I'm okay. sorry, I'm not the chair. <laughs> no, it's okay, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, um, Nancy, when you're ready to do your share, thank you. So um, we're addressing the historic budget, which is on page three of the culture recreation yellow tab if you're following along in uh, budget books. And I'd like to welcome um, Andrea Young, uh, the epitome of all things historical in oh. England, and, and Kevin Burke, the uh, present chair of the Historical Commission. Um, the budget itself is pretty straightforward with respect to salaries um, there is an increase of $6,441, which basically represents um, a well-deserved pay raise for Andrea as a result of the wage and classification study. So, Nancy, I'm seeing the um, agenda being displayed. Sorry to interrupt, Bob. No, I appreciate it. Nancy, could you put up the budget? Great. There Wonderful. we go. Excellent. Thank so, you. So the, um, the increase in salaries is solely due to the wage classification study. Expenses are actually going down by $150. Um, and um, so the total budget is increasing by $6,290.42. That's a 7.4% increase. The salaries are increasing by 8.3%. Um, just, just on the side note, Bob, I just want to remind everybody that that increase really isn't that big, only due to that the Article 4 money for the, the classification study wasn't put in at the time these were printed. So the revised 22 total should be a little bit higher. So the increase isn't as dramatic as you as everybody thinks these all, all these budgets are. Okay. And the um, historic commission also um, uh, is in charge of certain funds. Um, there's a historic preservation fund, uh, and uh, there are uh, numbers about that. The FY22 budget amount is 84,556, which I believe is the balance in the fund. Uh, there is an additional request for $3,000. I know we're not addressing that tonight. Uh, and uh, that basically uh, represents a proposed consolidation of um, uh, Keith German's uh, military monument preservation duties with the historic commission's um, um, 
uh, monument preservation duties. Uh, the other and major fund that the Historic Commission is in charge of is the Greenbush Historic Preservation Trust. And I think you'll be pleased to see that that basically has a beginning balance of $1.2 million. When, and the, uh, uh, Bob, yes. excuse me for interrupting. Uh, is this on any of the worksheets? It's, it's on page seven of the, uh, of the culture and recreation section okay. of the budget books. Thank you. And I think Nancy is in the process of putting it up. Uh, you'll see that through the, um, could, you, could you go back to the um, green bush? Thank you, Nancy. Uh, you'll see that through the genius of Gene Montgomery that uh, the corpus of this trust fund earned $93,000 last year. Uh, Andrea has more to say about this and has some interesting slides on it. And so I don't want to steal her thunder, so I'm going to stop there. There is also a preservation projects fund, um, uh, which is also in the materials that has a beginning balance of $126,719. Now, Andrea has put together some slides that are streamlined from um, her board, her select board presentation, but I, I think they hit all the high points of the mission role and responsibilities of the historic commission. So with that, Andrea, I will turn it over to you. And you. Nancy, I think you have Andrea's slides to put up. It's a power, there we go. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, are these the ones you received today? Um, let's see. I uh, don't think so. Uh, these are the ones that I took them down probably around five o'clock from the folder. I think, the I think, box folder. I, I think I think Andrea sent you a new slide deck today. I did about one thirty today, Nancy. Yeah, I see it. It's gonna take me a second, Andrea, so. Oh, me. thank you, I appreciate you doing this. Not a problem. I'm just on two different computers. So I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. Okay. Andy, if you recall, I think last year you were my liaison, and so I think um, you you dug right into this Greenbush Historic Preservation Trust. So, uh, and um, Jean used some of that as a as a background for what information she gave me today. She just updated it. So, great, excellent, thank you. Um, could uh, maybe you could distribute you or, or uh, Bob Curley distribute those new slide the new slide deck to each of us, Bob. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Nancy. Um, and Andrea, by the way, I disagree with Bob's characterization. You uh, with you as having everything that's historical and old about this town. I think that was completely. <laughs> Inappropriate and out of order, and I just want to put my objection on the record. <laughs> I, I, object, I object to the mischaracterization of my comments. <laughs> oh, gosh, thank you. So, uh, very briefly, um, I staff two commissions the Historical Commission and the Historic Districts Commission, um, and the missions are related um, to preserve the town's historic architectural and archaeological resources for future generations. I think um, people who've gone before me have done a, a good job thus far. And so we continue to build on their success uh, and also to preserve the town's unique character and maintain the sense of place that residents and visitors associate with Hingham. 
Thank you. Um, I included this um, after talking with Bob because I think there's sometimes a misunderstanding about um, the um, how the Historical Commission and the Historic Districts Commission make their decisions. And essentially, if you look at this, um, no matter what state you're in, um, everybody has uh, a local historic districts commissions. They have a local historic commission in, in many towns. And also each of these bodies reports to the state historic preservation office. And of course ours is the mass historical commission. Now um, in turn, this um, group reports to the National Park Service and um, sends them reports and I contribute my annual reports as well um, so that they can forward those on. And ultimately the Department of Interior is the, um, the authority by which we, uh, from which we gain our um, <clears throat> guidelines. So um, I, it's hard sometimes for people to understand it's not just local rule. Um, every historic districts commission in the United States has the same, um, essentially the same guidelines for work in historic districts. And um, also each historical commission has certain responsibilities that were set forth um, in the National Preservation Act of 1966. Thank you, Nancy, you can go to the next one. Um, so basically the mission is accomplished by, um, we, the historic districts, we have all sorts of guidelines on our website for the treatment of historic buildings. Um, the process for the Historic Districts Commission is design review. Um, which is an extensive um, process. And depending on the information that the commission gets, it can go rather quickly or not. So um, from what the applicant provides. And we issue a certificate of appropriateness. Um, that's the decision. And the historical commission, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that the enabling legislation for the Historic Districts Commission is Mass General Law Chapter 40C. And with the Historical Commission, um, we begin with the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966, and um, also Mass General Law Chapter 40, Section 8D. I put in there, there's a Section 106 review that is available to the Historical Commission from under the um, the National Historic Preservation Act. And that kicks in when we have um, projects like um, the Greenbush right-of-way or any federally or state funded project that may impact um, historic properties. And so uh, thanks to that, um, <laughs> that is in part why we got the Greenbush um, Preservation Trust, and that's how we also got our tunnel underneath uh, uh, Hingham Square. So um, anyway, so the, the Historical Commission is charged um, through this national act for maintaining a comprehensive um, list of historic architectural archeological assets of the town. And we have that and we add to it periodically. Um, and there are right now about 1,500 listings, both in historic districts and properties not in historic districts. Um, the Historical Commission values education. We're launching a speaker series um, this coming year. We have um, John Meacham coming. We also have in the past published numerous books. Um, <clears throat> that I'm sure you've seen, Not All Has Changed, um, Bucket Town, um, When I Think of Hingham, uh, Tranquility Grove. There are just a number of, um, of books that the commission has published. And we also um, manage historic properties through the demolition delay bylaw. So that offers us an opportunity 
to look at um, buildings that are being proposed for demolition and to determine whether or not there is any historical significance. And if so, um, should the building be preserved? And so it's a, it's a process um, that an applicant must go through. Um, and let's see, uh, as Bob mentioned earlier, we have the Preservation Projects Fund, and that's where we receive donations. Um, and people get a letter from me so that they're tax deductible. Um, and also, so now we get to the Greenbush Historic Preservation Trust that I'm, so if you could move on, Nancy. So this has just been great for the town. It is um, not a mitigation fund. The mitigation was done um, before the railroad uh, came back to us um, in 2007, before it was resurrected. And so um, people along the right of way, uh, if they qualified in terms of uh, proximity to the right of way, um, they were allowed a certain, um, they were given um, a level, of, a decibel level. So if you were a one, you were able to get um, um, $5,000 per decibel. So you, you were able to get 20,000 um, or yeah. And if you were a level four, um, you got an increased amount. So, um, but that was the mitigation and that's done. Um, but what Alexander McMillan, who was special counsel at the time, um, did for the town was to uh, negotiate this $1.35 million um, preservation fund. And the idea was to um, make sure that any adverse effects from the Greenbush right of way going through the town would be able to be, um, there would be repairs, there would be um, anything that would continue to make the properties on the right of way um, maintain their historic character. Um, <clears throat> so in um, what we have done is given out between 2013, when that was our first round of funding and 2021, um, the Historical Commission awarded uh, right around $900,000 because it was determined early on by actually, I think it was when Bob was chair um, that the, uh, we would give out 100,000 per year in total um, for all the applicants. Um, so as not to spend down the fund too quickly. So this is the only fund that allows private homeowners to apply and many do. And so we've had, um, we've given out money for things like window restoration, foundation work, uh, structural work for barns. Um, so to name a few things. And then we also had 42 nonprofits uh, applying, including the town of Hingham. So I have um, listed uh, probably some of our, <clears throat> our biggest grants uh, in total. And the Heritage Museum was largely supported in addition to the Community Preservation Committee, also by the Greenbush Trust. And over time, that plus the Old Ordinary, um, which as you know, is the House Museum. Um, so they received a, a, a good chunk of assistance, I think. Um, the Hingham Cemetery and the Ames Chapel um, also received um, money as they were trying to rehab the uh, Ames Chapel. New North Meeting House Corporation, they've benefited greatly too. And they have a very small, um, they have a very small um, uh, group that is um, congregation is the word I'm looking for. And they have the, New North Meeting House Corporation, and then there's the New North Meeting House Church. And so to the corporation, we've given uh, 72,900 over time for um, a ramp so that 
they can make the church accessible. Um, accessible toilets. Um, we also, they did work on the facade, you've probably noticed this year. Um, and it's, they painted it, they repaired um, some of the architectural features that were rotting away and also um, rebuilt the stairs. So, um, and the South Shore Country Club, uh, we've given money to them over time. And that's been for such things as, again, accessible toilets, boiler replacement. So just uh, a number of things. Oh, and the roof on the restaurant. Um, and finally, Harbor Development and the trustees of the Bathing Beach have received money. One was um, Harbor Development received money to for enhancements to Whitney Wharf and the trustees, um, you've probably seen the signs of the bathing beach, um, the historical signs that um, they've interpreted um, and, and they're just wonderful, great work. And so um, there we have it. So next slide, please. So this is Jean, what Jean um, wanted to add. And so um, this is beyond my uh, capability. So, but I'm sure you all can understand, <laughs> understand it. What she did basically was go through um, the expenditures from the Greenbush Trust. And she went back a number of years, not all the way back, but she could account for, um, she could account for a little over 800,000. And um, I said, we gave out about 900,000, which is in fact, um, the case because, but sometimes applicants did not use all of the money that was granted. And so it remained in the fund, the, the rest of it remained in the fund. Um, it's a reimbursement fund. So they pay their bills and give me the receipts and then I submit them. Um, and then also um, they, uh, some, some people just didn't even launch their projects. So, and I have a number of examples of that. So um, that accounts probably for the difference in what Jean, Jean had, because we were just, um, we were surprised that in essence, the fund, which started at a 1.35 million is still at 1.2 something. And so we didn't spend down very much over the years. Um, and that again, like Bob said, is due to Jean's genius and our return on investments. So essentially last year, um, we accrued $93,000 from the investments and we gave out a little over, or less, a little less than 100,000. So we essentially broke even. So um, we've, um, I think we've been with Jean's help I think we've been managing this responsibly over time. So that's it. I don't know if Kevin has anything that he wants to add. Um, if so, Kevin, you go ahead. If not, uh, I think we're open to questions from members of the committee. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Curley. I have nothing to add. I think Andrea has done a wonderful job generally and specifically <clears throat> tonight describing what we do and how it's done. And um, Hingham is lucky to have dedicated people like her to, to serve the interest of the town and make it the beautiful place that it is. Uh, thanks for exalting me to chair, Kevin. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a past chair at this point. I'm, I'm a humble liaison. Um, but if, um, and Julie Straley is our esteemed chair. So Hi, neighbor. Hi, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Hi, Julie. Sorry. That's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, George, go ahead. I, uh, uh, Nancy, can we go back to the uh, to the budget?
Oh, that's Bathing Beach, Julie. Or um, Nancy, that's Bathing Beach. There we go. All right. Um, thank you, there Andrea. You um, that, was, uh, that was a great presentation. I just oh, thank had, you. I had one question on the, the assessment from, for monuments, and there's 2,000 in the budget, and you're asking for another three. And I'm, I'm just drawn back to last year's town meeting and the CPC um, grant of, um, of money um, for monument repair. And I, I'm wondering what kind of assessment are we doing and what's, you know, why is it that last year we agreed to, you know, to repair or re update monuments or whatever the right word is, and now we're doing an assessment or something. Could you just kind of pull that all together for me, please? Sure, sure, I'd be glad to. Thank you for the question. Um, it, it, it can be somewhat confusing. Um, last year, we applied for a grant from um, Community Preservation uh, to do some work on a number of, of military monuments. As um, Bob mentioned earlier, we have combined Keith's duties and my duties with respect to maintaining um, the monuments and markers throughout the town. So that was CPC funds, and um, those will be expended. I think that was $15,000 that we requested and received. This, on the other hand, um, in my budget, actually is um, Tom Mayo's uh, idea. He thought that it would be good if we could take the sum total of our monuments and do a triage, essentially, so that we could identify which ones needed work and the most work. And um, so he thought that every year we could propose five monuments or markers to the CPC for funding. Um, and what I found out is that it is $2,000 is not enough to get somebody here to look at our 50 some odd monuments and markers. And um, it's just driving around town to look at everything and assess the condition um, is, uh, it, it would cost us a lot more than that. And we certainly wouldn't get a treatment plan or treatment suggestions um, about what needs to be done. So Tom proposed that we added uh, another 3000. And so that's what I'm gonna work with this year and have to have someone come out and look at all our monuments and markers. They've really not been assessed. Um, they are assessed when we recommend them for work. So on a rotating basis, we do the um, victory, the iron horse, which is not iron, at the um, bathing beach. We do the seated Lincoln at Fountain Square and a number of others, every plaque, every um, bronze plaque um, and marker, stone markers, mile markers, whatever, they, they get treated on a rotating basis. And so at that time, our conservator, the art conservator will assess what needs to be done. And, um, but I'm probably being more confusing, George. <laughs> so essentially there are two separate Two separate things. The work will be done on the um, the monuments and markers that we brought to town meeting last year, um, and that that'll be done as soon as the weather gets better. And um, this will be a process of assessment that I will um, undertake with somebody um, to be determined this year. Okay, and if you did get the extra three thousand, would that allow you to do the? I think you said something like fifty uh, monuments, or oh yes, I mean that that would really um, that would make it worth someone's while to spend um, time in town looking at um, some of our key markers. I I'm not sure that they would, with our guidance, Keith and my guidance. You know, we'd certainly pick out those that were most in that we thought were most in need and. Um, you know, we've got photographs of everything. So 
George, George, as I understand it, that will not get the work done. Right, right, right. No, I understand that. I understand. I just It'll didn't know if with... that would would get get an assessment. So at least we knew um, or could estimate what what the repair cost would be uh, for some future um, future town meeting or a CPC project or whatever. Yes, that's the objective, George. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Andy, I, I'm, I I just wanted to say if there are no if there are no other questions that I found this really really interesting and helpful. So thank you, thank you very much. This was... Oh, thanks, Andy. I appreciate that. Does anyone else have any questions? Andrea, I have just a quick follow up to Jordan's sure. question about the three thousand dollars additional request. Yes. So you hire someone with this um, additional uh, money to go through the uh, monuments. Do you expect this to happen every year, or every couple of years that you'd wanna bring in someone to assess the mon monuments or how, um, and what kind of um, rotation would you, it says annual assessment monument. So do you expect this to be a recurring cost? Um, I do. Uh, I think it will know better once we do the first uh, the, the first go round and see what kind of information we have, and you know that may allow us to um, lower the amount um, for the next year. So I'm sorry I don't have a better answer, but okay. that's that's the intention, Julie. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else have any questions for Andrea or Bob? Okay, then Bob, can we get a recommendation, please? Yes, I'm going to recommend $83,633 for salaries and $7,213 for expenses. And I'd very much like to thank Andrea for the work she's put into this preservation and Kevin for all the work that he's put in on behalf of the commission. The uh, Greenbush Historic Preservation Trust is a real success story. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob and um, committee members. I appreciate the opportunity and thanks for your guidance, Bob. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. Okay, up next we have the building department budget and we have Mike Clancy with us, our building commissioner, and it's my budget. Yes. <laughs> this is it. Excellent. Thanks, Daily. That's all right. Um, so the building, while well, Nancy's getting the building budget up there, if you re recall, some of you have been around for a while. Uh, a couple of years ago, the building department was merged into the public safety set of budgets. Uh, which actually makes a lot of sense if you um, if you think about it in that enforcing all the codes is part of that public safety. But but also if you think back to when we had the terrible storms, um, I guess now a couple of months ago, um, the building department was in, very much involved in assessing whether homes that now suddenly had trees on them uh, were safe or not. And so they were often out with the fire department or the police department. Um, so it is a public safety issue as well. So in terms of the budget, um, this is basically a flat budget, um, a, a level services budget. The building department is a little unusual from our other budgets because part of the building department is paid out of our operating budget and part is paid out of um, a fund that's created by the fees, a revolving fund created by the fees for electric gas, and I think I'm leaving one off, uh, electric gas and plumbing. And so, um, so it isn't really the case that the first page is simply all of the money that is going to the building department. Uh, but it's the part from the operating funds. So if we if we look at that um, in terms of salaries, there is a slight increase, um, and that increase is by and large due to um, the wage and classification difference. Um, 
and as and and it's also again I should say it's the partial salary because the other part of the salary is paid out of the revolving fund. If you turn to the compensation worksheet, um, you see how this fund, how the um, salaries in the general fund, how those are comp uh, computed. Um, one thing I did want to say, there's a stipend, which uh, we haven't necessarily seen before uh, to the department head. And that stipend is for all of the after hours emergency work um, that the building department head does. So thinking about that weekend, the, um, you know, Mr. Clancy was basically on, was working all weekend <laughs> uh, in dealing with those whatever, well, I think we, the number we heard from Randy was 150 trees. Um, so in terms of that, there's also a, um, for certain employees, a longevity for the administrative assistant and secretary. Um, and so that's where the increase is. And I have to say, I totally apologize, but I don't think I ever wrote down the amount of the increase. So um, but we'll figure that out in a minute. So, so the salaries that um, are under the general fund are $262,791. Um, salaries under, and salaries under the revolving fund are 305,175. Um, and you might remember Sue has told us before the way that this revolving fund operates, anything that we can allocate to it based on the plumbing, electrical, um, and gas and gas fees, but it has to be related to that. So anything that we can uh, comes into that. And you see um, they have, um, Mike has provided the revolving fund um, over the years on, I think it's on page four of this. All right, so that's the salaries. Um, the expenses are flat. There are no changes. Uh, I did ask Mike about the fuel issue because we've been seeing fuel uh, increases ever on, I think, every budget that has fuel. Uh, but here, um, the idea is those fuel increases are likely to be with the inspections uh, and the inspectors. And so there, that's why there's no allocation for that here. Nancy, can you go back to the expenses uh, to the first sheet? Uh, Sorry, yeah. I'm probably not being as organized as I should be. No, it's okay. I'm just like, thank you. Um, let's see. And I think, uh, so I think that's also the total budget being requested under the operating budget is $278,751. And Mike, if you want to share your slides, Nancy, if you want to move to the slides and then we can have questions. Um, my, my name's Mike Clancy. Uh, I am the building commissioner for the town of Hingham. Um, I would like to present my budget for 2000 FY23 and um, the mission and service is uh, the Building Inspectional Services Department falls under the Massachusetts Department of Public Safety. We enforce a series of 14 international codes, including, including the State Building Code, Residential Commercial, the Fire Code, Existing Building Code, Mechanical Code, Swimming Pool, swimming pool and Spa Code, Energy Conservation Code, the Architectural Access Board for Disabilities, the Zoning Act, Chapter 40A, the Zoning Bylaw, the General Bylaw, the Plumbing, Gas, and Electrical Codes, and the, uh, the building officials are on call 24 seven. We work very closely with the Fire Department, Police Department, and DPW. Um, next slide, please. Um, these um, figures and things are through October. However, when I get uh, done with this slide, I can give you the updated um, um, figures. Uh, the permit fees collected through 2021 uh, through October is 
$254. Um, that figure now, since the first of the year, is $1,409,199. Um, building sheet metal, certificate of inspections, final cost after David's, certificate of use and occupancies, um, that was one million nine, uh, $1,009,894. Uh, the plumbing and gas and electrical, is uh, $165,030.50. Um, the total uh, issued permits to date, that was in October, was 3,007. Um, however, right now, we have a figure at the end of the year of 3,591. Um, total inspections to date for building sheet metal, uh, electrical, plumbing, gas, zoning complaints in, up until October was 4,752. The new figure is 5,802. Um, next slide, please. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, key incentives, uh, building projects under construction and nearing completion in Hingham. The Amazon Distribution Center is under construction at 100 Industrial Park Road. Derby Street shops continue to renovate, including two new restaurants and a small addition. Planet Fitness renovated their existing space. Uh, the Hingham Shipyard continues to renovate in its existing spaces, as well as renovations of the DCR maintenance building. Uh, 105 North Street, um, if anybody's been through the center of town, has uh, the building was demolished and now they're in the process of uh, putting the foundation in for a new residential and commercial building. Uh, several homes throughout the town have been demolished and um, rebuilt over the past year. Um, next slide, please. Um, the salaries um, that was just discussed at uh, 262,791. And again, that was on the, out of the general fund. Um, we have six full-time personnel, one building commissioner, two administrative assistants, three building officials. We also have six part-time personnel, which are building officials, which would be uh, building inspectors, plumbing, gas, inspectors and electrical inspectors. Uh, the expenses have stayed the same for the past three years of 15,960. The major items, uh, 5,000 for in-state travel inspections, uh, 2,678 for vehicle fuel. Um, we will be having a new code change this year. Uh, so we'll be going into the 10th edition of the building code. So those uh, books for, for two sets of books will be approximately $2,500. Uh, the building revolving uh, fund is credited with all plumbing, gas, electrical permit fees and is used to pay the related in inspectors. I think that is it on the presentation. And I found um, I found my note on the so the increase in salaries is nineteen thousand three hundred and six dollars, which is about seven point nine two percent increase, and that means the overall increase in the budget since the expenses were flat is about seven point four four percent. So, sorry, I didn't have that note in the right place. Um, George. Well, thank you, Davelyn, and uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, Mike, I just wanted to go back for a second to the schedule that you have that's labeled the Building Revolving Fund, FY 2010 through 2021. Yeah. And, um, and I was looking in particular, um, starting in FY 20, um, expenditures are considerably larger than receipts. So I'm just wondering if you could uh, help us to understand what the what the long term trend would that be is in that area or if you know unless we get revenue 
back to at least equaling expenses, we're going to reduce that fund balance to zero, and uh, and then I'm not quite sure what's going to happen. But maybe uh, maybe you can give me some explanation there. Sure. Um, we did um, order some new trucks out of there. Um, so we've had one come each year for the past three years. Um, I also have talked to um, um, Tom and um, Art about adjusting the uh, permit fees because we are low compared to the rest of the towns around. So I'm, right now I'm in the process of seeing what the, the, the difference is between homes and different um, uh, commercial projects. Um, but again, half the salaries um, <laughs> come out of that uh, fund. And, and this started before I came to town. I came in 2013 that the fund was gradually getting larger and larger. And the town decided that um, half of my salary, half of uh, the, the administrative assistance salary would come out of that fund and work some of it down. And that's what we've been doing over the years. And you're absolutely correct. If something is not adjusted, we will run out of money that way. But you're, you're absolutely correct. And as far as the only way I can figure out is either we would have to cut personnel or we would have to raise some of the fees or more of um, my salary and the two administrative assistance salary would be taken out of the general fund rather than out of um, the revolving account fund. Can I add to that? Uh, one of the main reasons why we did that was to bring this fund balance down. If you notice, it was increasing in dramatic uh, fashion prior to us thinking outside the box and putting some of the expenses to this fund. The only reason I think, George, the last couple of years that the revenue is lower is because of COVID. Mm. Um, if you look a couple of years up, you'll see the revenue far outweighs the expenses. Plus we bought those trucks. We bought three trucks in the next last three fiscal years. Mm -hmm. We're probably not gonna see the same rate of, gro of growth that we were four or five years ago. I think you will. Oh, you do, okay. Well, great, oh, yes. great, okay. Yes, yeah. if you yeah. see the building permits, Building permits are coming back, and okay. I, I believe these will too. All yeah. right. We we also had those three large projects all going at the same time. Right. Uh, the condos down the shipyard, over on Beale Street, and then on uh, uh, three nineteen Lincoln Street. Right. So those were all going at the same time, and we did bring in, you know, more fees than um, than a normal year. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Well, it sounds like you guys are on top of it, and uh, and it and it. I like the point that you're comparing uh, our fees to other towns, and we'll make adjustments as necessary. So, okay, thank you, Mike. Sue's right on top of it <laughs> all the time. If I have any questions, I give her a call. <laughs> I would agree with you there. She is um, she's she's great to have, and and uh, she is right on top of everything. So, thank you, Sue. Anytime. Does anyone have any other questions for Mike or Davaline? Okay, Davaline, do you want to give us your recommendation? Yes, so I recommend for the building department um, out of the general fund that salaries in the amount of $262,791 and in terms of expenses, uh, $15,960 for a total of budget of $278,751. Sorry. All right. Thanks, Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. And again, if there's any questions or concerns, don't hesitate to give me a call about anything. And I Hopefully I can answer the question or I will call upstairs and ask Sue the question. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Mike. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So next on our agenda, we have the trustees of Bathing Beach. So that's mine. Um, Ed Johnson was supposed to be here. I don't see him on here. And I emailed him a little while ago. Unless yep, he I'm on. Oh, you're under a different name. Okay. Yeah, and my wife's uh, <laughs> laptop I'm using under Liz. <laughs> okay, so that's Liz. <laughs> um, so we're ready then. So I'll let um, Ed, I think if there's only one slide for him to go over. So if Nancy, if you could pull that up and then I can go over the numbers. As you see, um, there's three trustees of the Bathing Beach. I've been here on the budget, being a former member of the uh, advisory committee. I've been assigned the duty. And our full budget request is uh, 40,672 for next year's FY23 budget. The vast majority of the budget naturally is, is salaries of 27,372. Um, our lifeguards, we usually start them around when the school gets out in June, uh, around mid-June. So we still have some costs for this fiscal year in our personnel account to pay for the lifeguards. And um, we don't know as, as of right now how many lifeguards are coming back. Uh, the rec department is doing the direct supervision for, the, for us now, since there's only three trustees and we're, all, we're volunteers. So we have the rec department who, who's uh, involved with the management of the kids anyways. They, they, know, they, know, they know the area very well and they, they handle it very well for us. Um, so the vast majority, as I said, is personnel costs of 27,372. And the building and grounds, each year the sand winds up down the beach ramp. If people are familiar with the, um, the beach area down there, especially in Northeast Storms. And Randy Sylvester has his people bring up in front end loaders, replenishing the sand back up to the beach. Um, at some point, we're going to need some new sand. That's why I have increased the budget there to get some new sand in the area, because some of it's not able to get back. It's gone forever in, in, in the uh, harbor. Um, under utilities, I'm requesting $1,500. We we still have the uh, the new uh, bathhouse and the old bathhouse going on at the same time. Because of COVID-19, we didn't open up the old bathhouse. Only the lifeguards use that for changing and storing the uh, equipment there. Um, and electric is $1,500. Utilities, water, we have an outdoor shower now. So there was an increase in water usage. So that's why that's gone up. Um, Consolia supplies, $650, which is for clean supplies, for toilet paper, for the, uh, for the uh, bathrooms in the old bathhouse that the lifeguards use. And uniform allowance, every year we buy the new uniforms for the lifeguards. That comes down to $1,850. Um, we give all the lifeguards, because of the, the situation with the students going back to school, we lose a lot of lifeguards come mid-August. And we bring on some new lifeguards, which are mostly the high school kids at that point. And, and we uh, have them all the supplies for the uh, t-shirts, sweatshirts, hats, and the, and the swim trunks. So the total um, amount of money is thirteen thousand three hundred for the non-personnel costs. The total budget is forty thousand six hundred and seventy-two dollars for the year. Uh, that's our request from the trustees. Thanks, Ed. Um, yeah, so I can just kind of go through the numbers just quickly again. So the overall budget um, increase from last year for for $1,553, which is a 3.9% increase. Um, and really the only place that there was an increase from the previous year is uniform allowances. And like Ed said, um, they're running into the issue where kids are going back to school. So they're having to bring more lifeguards on um, at the end of the summer, which is increasing the amount of uniforms that 
um, all the lifeguards are getting, which is the hats, t-shirts, sweatshirts, and swimsuits. So that's why you're seeing the increase in that. Um, for the r &M grounds, like he said, it's bringing the sand in. There's also repairs to the fence where the seagrass is when there's storms. Um, that's been a lot of damage to the fences. Um, and then he went over with the electric, the water, and then the custodial supplies are just basic supplies, um, toilet paper and cleaning supplies. Does anyone have any questions? I have a question about the, um, the new bathhouse or the new beach house snack shack. Mm -hmm. And when it was nearing completion, I remember that there was um, an estimate in last year's budget, not really knowing um, what the utilities would end up costing. And then there was also working out with the, um, the leaseholder, the, the restaurateur, about um, that entity paying some of the fees. So I was wondering, Ed, if you could just sort of take us through if um, it doesn't look like there's really any changes, but how that works with that building and the uh, leaseholder for right. those kinds of utilities. Right, uh, right now, Greg is Sarah from Mopes Pot, um, who, who runs the operation down there, um, is paying for all the utility costs uh, for, for the bathhouse. Because of COVID-19, um, the community room, we, we haven't opened that up at, at all. So it's essentially the only people coming in are using the bathrooms inside the bat, uh, inside the new snack shop. Um, in the community room, uh, we, we don't have any uh, chairs in there or tables or anything. So it's, that's been vacant. So, so that usage hasn't happened. Um, hopefully after COVID-19, we'll be able to use that room. Uh, we'll be able to rent it out to uh, people in town for, for small events. And, and at that point, we should be able to bring in some from money, some money from uh, from the rental fees. And just to quickly follow up about the furniture purchase, is that something that is money left over from the project? And uh, when you get around to um, when you're able to buy furniture, when we're right able to uh, use the community room. Uh, as of right now, um, um, we haven't put that in the budget yet. Well, it will be if somebody's rent, renting out the room, they're going to have to pay the, uh, the cost of renting items in there. I, I think we're still a year away from really operating that room because I, I don't see COVID-19 being uh, totally gone by, by now in six months. So I, I think it's going to be another year away until we actually operate that room. Okay. Does anyone else have else have any questions for Ed or for Kristen? Okay. Kristen, do you have a recommendation? Um, I recommend for the trustees of Bathing Beach a budget of salaries in the amount of twenty seven thousand three hundred and seventy two and expenses in the amount of thirteen thousand three hundred for a total budget of 40,672. All right. Thanks for coming tonight, Ed. Thanks, and Ed. Thank you, Kristen. You're welcome. Okay, so next we have um, the Shrek budget for the 911 system. So that's me again. Um, so this budget is a pre it's pretty pretty easy to figure out. Um, thank you for having the slide up there. So the South Shore Regional Emergency Communication Center is in Town Hall. Um, we you probably all saw it if you hadn't before when we did our tours. Um, it basically serves Hingham, Norwell Hall, and Cohasset. It's staffed by an executive director, a deputy director, five supervisors, and 17 dispatchers, who if you've ever had to call them, they're very good. I speak from personal experience there. Um, their total number of calls for services in fiscal year 21 
uh, were 67,865. Hingham's number within that, the total number of calls from Hingham was 25,200. Um, so that works out to be a, a little over 37% of the calls are from Hingham. Um, that matters because there's a formula for determining the assessment. So that ultimately becomes important. Um, if you go back just to the budget number, go up one, I think. Um, so the budget, the department request for this year, this coming year is 974,510. You might wonder how that assessment is determined. Um, it is, there is a formula that's used um, that includes things like the number of calls, the population, a variety of things. What Sue does, since this is what an amount she gives us, um, she takes what we paid last year and assumes that there's a 5% increase. So basically, so that's, um, that's where it comes from. Um, and so the increase for next year would be $33,328. don't know if anybody has any questions or if Sue wants to add anything to my Actually, the only thing I'm going to add is the 974-510 is just a 5% only due to that um, the Shrek board members have not voted on a budget yet. Um, Tom Mayo said, I believe they had a meeting. I'm not sure they voted on it or not, but that could go up just a bit. Okay. So just and I think that would be because our call volume went up. Yes, that our call, our, yes, our call volume was a little higher percentage than normal. So, but that's our, our most recent information. Okay, does anyone have any questions? I think Bob and Andy and Caitlin. Oh, now I see it. Okay, go ahead, Bob. <laughs> Uh, just, I got an observation and a question. Uh, the observation is that uh, I know over the last few years, many of us were given the opportunity to tour the Shrek facilities. And it's a very valuable experience, uh, very worthwhile to see that. And I don't know with COVID whether our new members uh, would have the ability to do that or not but it might be make worth making an inquiry uh, for a, uh, a tour. Uh, the second question, or the, the only question I had really was, uh, do we get to see uh, the actual budget figures so that we kind of know um, how the salaries and expenses of Shrek are progressing year over year? Uh, as we do with our own budgets? Well, the only thing is, Bob, uh, their budget, it's, it's a to totally separate entity. So right. all we pay is our assessment. I mean, I, I, can, I can find out if, you know, I'll find out from Tom if I can share their, um, their actual budget. Oh, but do you get the numbers? Yes. Oh, okay. uh, and, and the only reason why I do is because uh, the accounting office, uh, as you know, does their financials, their payroll, and their AP. Well, so, I mean, yes, I do get a budget. If you're getting the numbers, I can sleep at night. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. And I think, Bob, in terms of your first question, I think when we were doing the um, tours, I think Tom Mayo did say if anyone wanted to tour Shrek, they could make arrangements. I think you'd just be required to wear a mask. I was just going to say that. So, well, I can um, take a show of hands right now if anyone wants to tell me if they want to take a tour. I have to say, I mean, I took the tour years ago, and it's like walking onto like the the Star Trek set or something. It's a really cool room with uh, a lot of good toys, computer toys, um, but it's certainly worth worth seeing. Um, so. Does anyone want to chime in now? Or I'll, send, I'll put it in the email. You can just email me back. Uh, let's see. So that's a good point, Bob. Thank you. Andy, you have a question? Uh, my, yeah, my question was really the, the question that Bob asked. I, I was going to ask 
uh, what the uh, total budget was and whether and who's who looks at it. So um, I guess the the answer to that is uh, is what we'll call Sue. Well, I get the budget and actually Tom, all each town administrator of the four towns are board members. So you can always reach out to Tom or, um, you know, we see the budgets and they vote on it. Okay. Thank you. Well, does anyone else have a question about uh, Shrek? Julie, I have a question. I just couldn't get to my hand. Uh... Um, yeah, Caitlin did too, I think. Uh, I know, so, her hand went down. So yeah, my, my question was similar to um, Bob and Bob's. Okay. Go ahead, George. All right. I found my hand raised there. There I am. So I, I think this is more maybe for Sue, um, Davaline. Um, so, Sue, can you, am I correct in understanding that there's a formula? for the assessment and each year the variables would be put into that formula and that is how the assessment would be determined yes first okay. they come up with the first they come up with a budget of what they need right and then yes then they they do the formula to get the percentage and each town gets assessed that percentage of the budget Okay, so so it's a, sort of a dynamic process. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else have any questions about Shrek? All right, Davaline, do you want to give you a recommendation? Yes. So I recommend for dispatch services for Shrek, as we call it, um, a budgeted amount of nine hundred and seventy-four thousand five hundred and ten dollars. Right. notation that that may increase <laughs> yes thank you i guess um we'll keep our ears out about um if that uh increases and we'll report back um okay last little budget for tonight is public safety utilities not and trying to downplay it but it's not a ton, not a huge one here but go ahead and that's also me. So these are uh, basically, there's two different ones. There are emergency water and then the street lighting expenses. So for the emergency water, it's a flat fee charged by the Weir, Weir River, I can never say that, water system uh, to maintain water. And the fire hydrants in town with that, um, so that's what, that's what it is. Uh, and that amount is recommended to be $443,251. And the way Sue does that is she takes um, the last quarter's water bill and uses that as the basis. So it's that times four, basically, <laughs> um, to get that amount. There's emergency uh, an emergency line for repair of hydrants. The hope is that we don't have to repair hydrants, but if we do, it's important to have the money because hydrants are very expensive and repairing them is very expensive. Um, and so this would be, I think the example Sue gave me if a snow plow uh, knocked out a fire hydrant, we would have to repair it, obviously. Um, and I think the repair probably, it, Five ten thousand dollars might repair two hundred or two excuse me two fire hydrants uh, if we're lucky. So, but at any rate, but as you can see, we didn't even have to use that before. So the total for emergency water would be four hundred and fifty three thousand two hundred and fifty one dollars. The lighting expense um, is what funds the street lights basically uh, through the Hingham Municipal Lighting Plant. And that's a, fat, a flat fee that's charged by the um, uh, Hingham Municipal Light to the town and it's $105,000. And I think that's it. Okay. Andy, you have your hand raised. I, I, yeah. Um, uh, David, do you know anything about this uh, maintaining water in the, 
the fire hydrant system is, in other words, are those uh, pipes from the water main to the hydrants maintained as full all the time? Yes, they are. Okay, so so why why does it cost so much? It seems to me once you fill up those pipes, um, how, I mean, how many times in the year? Well, they do they do flushing. They, there's fires. There's, it's a it's a flat fee that we paid Aquarian, and we now we pay Ware River. It's a flat fee to keep water in all those hydrants. And yeah, I guess I'm just wondering whether uh, whether the flat fee is is too high. Uh, so when we have Russell Tierney come and give us the water budget in a couple of weeks or so, maybe we could ask Russell if he uh, can uh, can give us some more information about that. That'd be perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I have no idea about where the pipes, where the water in the pipes and how it flows. That, um, that's beyond my expertise for sure. Anyone else have any questions about public safety utilities? Okay, Javeline, can you give a recommendation? Yes, I recommend a for emergency water, a total amount of $453,251. For uh, street lighting expenses uh, of $105,000. For a total public safety utilities of $558,251. All right, thank you. Okay, so moving to our next agenda item, if you can um, take your sharing screen sharing off, Nancy. Um, we have a um, guest speaker tonight. We have David Pace, who is chair of the personnel board. And, um, <clears throat> Sorry. So David is the chair of the personnel board. He's also been a longtime member of that committee. I've asked him to come speak to the advisory committee tonight to discuss the personnel board, how this team approaches its job, its general philosophy, last year's wage and classification study and equity adjustments, and their effect that we are now seeing in the municipal budgets. I'd like to note that the personnel board has met jointly with ADCOM in the past, every couple of years usually, usually with the select board. And I'm grateful that ADCOM has this opportunity tonight to um, come up to speed on this, um, on this topic um, because we're going to be going through the rest of the budget hearings. We are going to see more effects of the uh, wage and classification study adjustments. And of course, then we're gonna be deliberating the budgets ahead of town meeting. So I just think it's important for ADCOM members to be, um, to understand personnel costs. So um, we're gonna have the chance to ask David any questions and I hope that you feel free to do so. There's no dumb question or question that's too basic. Um, we wanna have the chance to really understand the subject matter. And if David thinks that the question is too sensitive related to any kind of collective bargaining strategy or otherwise, he will let us know and um, we won't be able to speak about it in our open meeting tonight. So with all of that, I would like to turn the meeting over to David Pace. Thanks, thanks Julie and uh, good evening. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to you um, and certainly Appreciate all the hard work you're doing, and hopefully this isn't too boring, and it's more of a nice break from the budgets and all the numbers you've been going through and will be going through the next few weeks. It's a tough task, so thank you. But um, as Julie said, my name is David Pace. I've been on the personnel board now for uh, about 15 years, I think now, so a long time. Uh, I've been chair of the personnel board for, I think, about eight years now, so uh, I've been doing this for a little bit, uh, maybe too long now. I'm not sure as I say that. It sounds like a long time. Um, just FYI, the other members of the group or the personnel board, there's five of us. In addition to myself, there's Russ Kahn. Uh, Russ has been on the personnel board maybe nine or 10 years now. Uh, Jack Manning, uh, who used to be a former ADCOM 
member. Um, he's been on the board probably eight, nine years now. Uh, Courtney Orwig um, has been on the board um, just about two years now. She joined literally just before COVID. And I'm not sure she's been at a live meeting yet uh, for the personnel board. And uh, Karen Johnson, uh, who many of you probably know, former ADCOM and select board member, uh, joined the personnel board back in June, I want to say, sometime around there. So um, uh, we have a good board, uh, fully up to speed now. We've been, been short for a little while. And as you can tell, um, there's no term limits on the personnel board. Many of us have been there for quite some time. And I think it's, it's one of those committees that it actually takes took me at least, uh, maybe I'm slower than others, a few years to kind of get up to speed and truly kind of understand what was happening. Fortunately, in Mike Puzo and Nelson Ross, I had some good mentors when I joined the personnel board. Um, so Julie, as you mentioned, I thought maybe do just a little bit of personnel board 101 um, for folks and then get into the wage and classification study and um, collective bargaining, uh, as Julie mentioned, and typically in years past, um, prior to collective bargaining, we often have a meeting with, with the ADCOM uh, select board, TA's office, and, and oftentimes the school community to kind of walk through upcoming negotiations, budget, you know, what expectations were. It didn't, didn't all come together this year. I'll kind of blame that on COVID, but uh, we at the personnel board are always happy to speak with you folks uh, anytime uh, it makes sense or anytime you have any questions or would like to. So with that, um, you know, I'll get into my my. Uh, personnel board 101. So start, you know, what do we do? What's our role? Why do we exist? And I think, you know, our primary purpose, we probably have two, our primary purpose is to administer personnel bylaw and to the wage and classification plan. Um, and then we establish policies, procedure, regulations, et cetera, around um, that are consistent with that plan as we see fit and necessary uh, for it. So, um, the wage plan and the personnel bylaw cover all town employees except those. We don't do any for just do know we don't do anything with the school. We have nothing to do with the schools. So well outside our jurisdiction, but um, the personnel bylaw and the wage classification plan cover all town employees uh, except those that are members of a union and except and those that are have individual employment agreements. There's I think somewhere between 10 and 12 employees who have individual employment agreements. Um, so uh, all other folks, which is 80 plus people, are covered by the plan. Uh, the personnel bylaw uh, will also extend to, in some ways, to those um, uh, un union members in some cases when it gets incorporated into the union contract or to uh, employees under employment agreements uh, um, to address issues like it could be, you know, holidays or sick leave and things like that. Um, and with that, kind of our responsibility, first and foremost, is to maintain and review all the job descriptions and, you know, have a good understanding of all the jobs of all the personnel in town. Um, our second to that, which is equally important, is to review the sal salary schedules of the plan. So we have a, a salary plan in place for all town employees. And uh, the personnel bylaw requires us to keep informed of what's happening in other towns um, because it's our responsibility to maintain a, a fair and equitable pay level within the town. And I'll get into it in a little bit later um, and how we do that. Um, and in addition to that, we often do a lot of additions. When new jobs come up, it's our responsibility to review it, grade it, place it within the system, reclassify pit positions when that becomes necessary. And we can also have the authority to uh, amend or at least recommend a town meeting amendments to the plan itself, which uh, happens fairly often as things come up over the course of the years, we realize some language changes are necessary within the bylaws or um, as you did last town meeting to kind of keep more consistent with um, other, uh, other towns, we recommended a modification to the vacation uh, bylaw to provide employees, I think it's over 25 years, of employment in town with an additional week of vacation. So they would have five weeks instead of four. Um, that's our primary job. Our second job um, is collective bargaining. Um, we have six unions in town. Uh, we have fire department, we have two police unions, the police superiors, the police patrol, uh, the library and two DPW unions, the supervisors and then the DPW staff. Um, and our responsibility is to negotiate those collective bargaining agreements on behalf of the select board. So we don't act on our own authority. We act 
for the select board in those negotiations. It's a very unique structure uh, I'm not aware of, and anybody I've talked to has never been aware of any other town that does it this way. Collective bargaining agreements are typically negotiated, often negotiated by the town manager or town administrator in conjunction with outside counsel. Um, this system was put in place over 50 years ago. Um, I'd like to say it's before I was born, but I was born, but uh, no, I didn't even know what Hingham, Hingham was at that time. Um, Tom O'Donnell implemented it many, many years ago. Um, and I think kind of borrowing some ideas from uh, his private practice as a labor lawyer. And, you know, I can only say it's worked pretty well for the town over the years. I think it's helped us to maintain uh, pretty good labor relations through the years with all of our, our union employees. Um, in, in some ways, it's because the personnel board can kind of act as a neutral party. We can insulate the select board, the management from some of these discussions. Um, it helps us to avoid sometimes in, in collective bargaining, you can get into some pretty tense, confrontational, kind of difficult conversations about management and employees. It allows us to kind of be that intermediary to kind of absorb comments, you know, I don't want to say criticism, but some of that discussion. Um, uh, we have nothing, it's not personal to us. We have nothing vested in it. We don't have an agenda. Um, and so we're able to kind of be there. And in some ways, it helps us to kind of facilitate discussions with the uh, union, I think, and, and, and many times can actually, um, they can say some things to us that maybe they may not say to others and kind of help to get through to a good resolution um, with that structure. So it's, it's worked very well, it keeps us busy, um, um, but it's, it's worked pretty well for the town. Um, you know, the other thing that's kind of um, kind of underlies all this is our 20 town comparison list, which um, every time I bring it up, somebody always says, well, I've heard about that. What is that thing? Why do we have that? And what is it? And um, it's always a great question. And uh, I would just say it's, you know, it's pretty fundamental to, to the town and um, it underlies you know, our whole approach to compensation is one of those things that if anybody ever suggests we should change, then I would kind of take a great pause and push back on that because it's, it's probably one of the more important things we've had in place. Again, it's, it's very unique um, to Hingham, uh, put in place over 50 years ago as well by Tom O'Donnell. Um, and it's, it's a very important tool. And, and so what is it? So we have uh, you know, some of you may, you know, in your own worlds, um, you know, work on compensation and, and we have basically create a comparative group of towns where we look to to see how they're paying and how they're compensating and, and what benefits they're offering to the employees. In a sense, it's, it's, your, it's your competitive job market and it's 20 or 19 other towns that were selected for both geographic proximity to Hingham. So you have some towns like Cohasset, Situate, uh, Hull, Norwell, Braintree. Um, in there. Um, and then you have some other towns that are demographically similar to Hingham. So towns like Lexington and Concord, Marblehead, Andover, um, uh, Wayland, I think Dedham, Needham, um, maybe Weston, I can't remember, I think Weston is in there. So you have kind of this combination of towns that are both um, similar to Hingham, either demographically or geographically. So the idea is that they would compete for our town employees. Yeah, that's your job market. And um, we use this 20 town comparison when we're looking at all town positions, whether it's the 80 plus employees that are um, you know, part of the wage and classification plan, whether it's a union member or whether it's a, um, uh, an individual under an employee contract. Um, and whenever a position comes up, you know, either as a, a union or as an individual position, we go out to our 20 towns, um, we get a comparisons for you know, what they pay, how they compensate that person in that role. Um, so if it's your you know, assistant town administrator, your head of HR or community planning director, we'll find out from the other 20 towns what their compensation level is for that person. They'll get ranked one in the 20 with Hingham in there someplace. And the goal um, or, or the philosophy in Hingham is that we will then compensate our employees just above the median. And so it doesn't matter whether you're the TA or any other role you have in town. When we look at that 20 town list, um, we, would, we would place a Hingham employee just above the median. So at the end of the day, they'd be number 10 on that list. Uh, and that combined, that 20 town comparison, that median uh, approach has kind of been going on for 50 plus years. 
and it's pretty fundamental to you know how we look at compensation in town and i would say vitally important to how we how we uh, move forward um put in context some of you may know nelson ross or have had the pleasure of dealing with him but nelson sadly passed away a few years ago but Longtime Hingham resident Nelson, um, and you know, honestly, he was one of the premier labor lawyers in the entire country. Um, and you know, we were, he served on the personnel board for a lot of years. And as I said, he kind of schooled me in this as well as some other members. And you know, one of the things he always said to me was, you know, when you get into collective bargaining in these issues, it's a search for standards. You have to have a standard and when you go through the process or you ever end up in mediation or arbitration or litigation over collective bargaining, it's about establishing standards. And Hingham has a standard, it's called a 20 town comparison and placing employees above the median. I can guarantee you almost any other town I've talked to doesn't have a standard. And so when they get into negotiations, there's no guidepost. And if they ever get into a um, mediation or arbitration, there's no guidepost to kind of say, this is how we've always done things. And, um, and it works very well. So it's, it's pretty important. Um, one of the things that it, it leads to, um, which I know folks are interested in, I can touch in, in more detail uh, specifics a little bit later, is equity adjustments. Um, what we find uh, typically it happens in, in union contracts is when you, um, do your 20 town comparison. As I said, our objective is to place employees just above the median at the number 10 position. Um, you often find when you pull the comps that their salary may be, you know, sometimes it's above the median. It could be four or five or six. Sometimes it's below the median at 12, 13, 14. And sometimes sadly it even falls to 18 or 19. Um, and so in those instances, you know, we feel it's, it's the obligation um, of the town, kind of we're committed to, to compensating people above or at the median. And so to bring somebody or give them an equity adjustment, a raise, if you will, that would bring them to that number 10 position um, in, the, um, in the 20 town comparison. You're looking at the 20 town comparison, it's, it's not a cap. It doesn't, it doesn't cap how high somebody could go but it's kind of a commitment to where you want to put people. And so you can't, you can't just manage it on the upside. You have to manage it on the downside as well. Um, I mean, if anybody has any questions, please kind of jump in um, at any time. Um, so one of the questions that Julie asked was, you know, we did a wage and classification. This is kind of a big year for the personnel board and a lot of wage issues this year. And um, I'm sure if you're reading the newspapers, there's a lot of wage pressures everywhere right now. Um, but um, we did implement a new wage and classification plan this year. Um, and to kind of go back to what I said before, one of our, our primary responsibility is to administer the plan, which is basically salary and benefits for your town employees um, and a stay informed to maintain a fair and equitable pay level for employees. And we do that using the 20 town comparison. So um, periodically we have to look at town employees and make sure they're being paid fairly and equitably. Um, um, so as I mentioned, we added, we did this this year for 80 town, 80 plus town employees, those not members of the unions. Um, we did a comprehensive review and just give a, a call out to Michelle and to Lisa um, Campbell um, in, in town who were kind of instrumental in helping us do this without them. We couldn't have done that. They, they put a lot of, lot of time into this. So we began the process in 2019 and we finished it and adopted a new plan, which went into effect in June 1st, um, 20, uh, 2021, this past June. It's the first comprehensive re review we've done of the employees pay in about 20 years. Um, that system was put in place back in, I think, 2002. Um, we did an abbreviated review um, uh, back in 2012. We had looked at doing one earlier, but given the Great Recession and, and a lot of the financial implications that came out of that, we postponed it. Um, in part, it cost money to do the review itself. Um, and we do, it's not like it's, it's nobody sees anything uh, for years. We do review these periodically or different positions periodically that will come up. Over the course of a year, there may be three, four, five, or six positions that come up for various reasons where we'll do a review and maybe have to adjust or maybe not adjust 
um, where they're placed on the wage uh, and, and uh, wage scale. Um, so it was a, a pretty long process, uh, as I said. It took about a year and a half um, to get through, um, and we all spent a lot of time on it. Um, and the first thing we had to do was go out to our 80 plus employees and review all of the job descriptions for those employees to make sure they're up to date. Some of these um, employees hadn't looked at job descriptions in 20 years and their jobs have changed, their responsibilities have changed. And it was important to update those and get accurate job descriptions um, um, as accurate as we could. We then had to grade each position. Um, we have, and we've, we adopted a new plan, um, a new grading system in connection with this wage plan, but we grade each position. They, they earn a certain number of points based on you know, education, minimum educational requirements, experience requirements. It's not, it's not to the individual in the job, it's to the position. So, you know, what kind of education is required for this position? How many years of experience are required? What's the scope of their responsibility? How many people um, report to them? Those types of things. We have nine different factors in which an individual position is graded on. And then based on their level, you know, we add up the points as they get graded and, and that places them in the scale, which goes from one to 13. And that's your grade um, for each position. So we really had to create a new grading system, review the job descriptions and regrade all 80 positions. And then um, we had to go out to our 20 towns and get comp salary data for all 80 positions, which um, is quite a task. Um, first of all, um, it's a lot of positions, a lot of data. Um, and this is where sometimes the, uh, this process is, is a little bit of art and science because not every town has every position that we do. Um, not every town, you know, title for a position is the same as ours and all the positions aren't exactly the same in terms of the responsibilities. So you have to kind of review as best you can, um, you know, uh, how that position stacks up against the other towns is it an accurate comparison and then try and place, create that 20 town comparison for each of those positions and then look to see, you know, where the average or the mean compensation is for that position. So if you say I've got a library director and you go out to however many towns that have libraries and have a library director and you kind of do an assessment against that and you find out where the median is for the library directors, and then you'll understand where that person, you know, helps kind of where that person gets placed on the scale to make sure they're placed, you're compensated competitively with other library directors or HR director or whatever the position would be. And so um, we basically had to evaluate where each of these positions would fall on the scale. And uh, as part of that, as I said, we haven't done this in 20 years, there, just as you know, as I mentioned before, with equity adjustments, we found um, you know some of these positions had fallen below where their competitors were, and so it was necessary to kind of bump them up a little bit to do that. The, the reality is, with the wage and classification plan, if my memory serves me right, you know, the total equity adjustments was somewhere in one hundred and forty or one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And we find often find is you know there were some positions that had to be adjusted some minimally, some not at all. But you often find there's a few positions that just got out of whack for some reason. And I think in the town, as well as I'll mention in the unions, there's a few positions that got just way out of whack for some reason, got way behind um, in their compensation. And so a big chunk of that equity adjustment was swallowed up in, in, in a few positions, which doesn't mean one or two people, it just means one or two positions. Um, and so, um, we went through that, adopted it, and presented it. It was adopted as part of town meeting um, and became effective as of June 1st. So I'll just pause for a second, take my own breath, but see if anybody has any questions, if somebody, if they're still awake. So I'm good? Okay. Um, the next element is really, um, uh, from there, is collective bargaining. Um, as I mentioned, we have six unions and uh, the union contracts typically come up every three years. Um, we do three-year deals. Um, you probably know um, they're actually due to come up in 2020, um, but then when COVID hit, we made a decision, um, we meaning the town, not me or the personnel board, um, that we would offer a, a one-year extension to each of the five unions that were coming up, not all six, just five. 
um, one year extension with a 2% um, uh, general wage increase and basically postpone um, the union negotiation until we thought COVID would have hopefully cleared up or we can get back to face to face meetings. Uh, kind of did, but not really. Um, and so four of the five unions accepted, the fire department did not accept um, that one year uh, 2% raise. Um, all the other unions did pretty, um, pretty quickly and actually most were pretty thankful and appreciative of it, um, the town stepping up like that. Um, and so when the union negotiations come up, um, it's, uh, it's a lot of work, um, but we really follow the same principles we do as it went through with all of the other towns. The first thing we do if we're negotiating with the police superiors union is um, we pull the comps for the police superiors and there are sergeants and lieutenants in the superiors unit. And so we'll look at our 20 towns and see how they compensate their sergeants and lieutenants. Um, and we look at the kind of the base level sergeant, the base level lieutenant um, when we do that. We then typically meet with the department head in that case, who would be the police chief and deputy chief uh, and uh, folks from the TA's office. Uh, in this case, it was Tom and, and Michelle was, was working on the uh, police negotiations. And we talked through um, you know, what we're looking at in terms of expectations from the town side. Is there anything that the police chief or the town is looking to get out of the bargaining uh, from the union? Any concessions, uh, any changes to the contract? And then we talk about what uh, we anticipate will be coming from the union as well as kind of get a sense of you know, who's on the negotiating the bargaining team and, and how's the atmosphere there? Are they, are they happy, unhappy, are they upset? Generally, generally doing pretty good, et cetera. Um, and then we get our parameters for negotiation from the select board. Again, it's the, we're, we're negotiating on their behalf and ultimately it's their responsibility to accept um, and approve the agreements. Um, and we, we have a team, so we have five, um, five different uh, negotiations going on this year. So um, we usually split up into teams of two people um, with, uh, from the personnel board, one of whom acts as the uh, lead in the negotiations, uh, and then uh, typically the department head, uh, police chief, and then somebody from the TA's office will, will be there as part of our team, uh, but always led by somebody from the personnel board. And when you're in negotiations, um, we kind of stress, both sides stress that, you know, it's, it's, we, we don't negotiate outside the room and we try to maintain, you know, really one person uh, from each side to be the, be the communicator and not have kind of freewheeling discussions. Doesn't mean other people can't speak or say stuff, but you try to kind of manage it as best you can. Um, we have some kind of guiding principles that we try to follow as we go through union negotiations that kind of were instilled really going again way back with Tom O'Donnell and Nelson Ross, which is um, we're all on the same team. You know, we may be sitting at the other opposite sides of the table today, but we're all working for the town of Ingham and we're all on the same team ultimately. And we got to find a right way to a solution here. Um, we always strive to try and maintain within Ingham good labor relations. Um, we try to remind ourselves that these are our employees and these are the folks who are out there representing the town and they're the face of the town. And so uh, we have to treat them as such and with respect. Um, we, we try to act constructively, productively, keep conversations productive, not kind of get off into any kind of, um, you know, tangents or rants uh, about what's happening. Although it can happen, you know, we often are the, we often absorb the brunt of some frustrations that union employees have at times, and that's okay. And that's part of the value of having the personnel board do it because it's not personal to us. Um, and at the end of the day, we know it's important to accomplish the town's objectives, but um, we, we really need to achieve a fair settlement with our folks who work for us. So those are kind of the broad parameters. Um, this year, as I said, we have five negotiations, all unions except for the DPW supervisors. We've now settled four of the five uh, union negotiations. The only one that's still outstanding is the DPW staff. Um, and they were just really the last to start uh, in our negotiations. Um, uh, as you probably know, um, you know, we, we agreed to, and, and it was kind of the directive of the select board to a general 3% wage increase um, with the unions. Um, for the past eight years or so, we had been at a 2% wage adjustment. 
uh, this year it went to a three. Um, in year my early days of the personnel board, it was a three. Again, there's there's no magic to that number. We try to maintain an overall cost, obviously, of three percent within the contracts generally. Um, a lot of that's dictated by um, again the marketplace. What's going on in the marketplace? You know, if people are getting four percent raises elsewhere in, in our comparative towns. It's hard to say we're going to give you two percent raise. The decision was made to give a 3% this year. I think part of that, uh, well, two factors, a number of factors, one of which was just kind of a recognition of uh, the value in, of the employees and kind of where um, and salaries were going. And we also kind of committed to a 3% salary increase. But there's a lot of other elements of a contract where money sits, whether it's in longevity incentives, stipends for different factors, um, different allowances that all add up as well. And so in the past, that's something we've always negotiated, maybe agreed to increases to get a deal done and try to kind of put this year, rather than kind of negotiating a lot of that, I think both the union and the town were just saying, let's kind of negotiate salary. And we didn't really do much else beyond salary this year um, uh, in those negotiations. Um, the only other thing we did do um, that was significant um, is with the police superiors and patrol, the town wanted to implement a, a body cam policy. And so uh, the union agreed to it, but you know, as any of these things, um, there's a quid pro quo, uh, nothing comes free. And so the quid pro quo um, for the body cam policy was an additional 1% wage increase for the police uh, officers in year one of the contract. So they effectively got a 4% raise in year one uh, and a 3% raise in year two and in year three. Um, um, we had hit on, hard on, this year, on, I think, with a lot of equity on, adjustments. And again, can I ask a question? Uh, sure, please. Just on something like that, is the scope of the board to just focus on the compensation of the employees? In that case, the body cams, the, that's on now the capital outlay budget for the town of Hingham this year. Would you ever theoretically go back to them and say, oh, well, we need the union or someone else to pick up the tab for something like that, or is the scope of your, it's strictly compensation? Um, I'm not sure we'd go back. I mean, it's, it is compensation. I mean, there's other factors that go into the contract. Um, I've never, I mean, I'm not a labor lawyer, but I've never seen to go back to him and say, you have to absorb the cost of it, of this, this uh, implementation. Um, I think it's, uh, I've not seen that happen. It'd be, I think it'd be a, that's be not, a tough it sounds like that's not, that's not typical. It, yeah. It, yeah. Even if two things are related, you know, compensation increase for doing this thing or service, uh, it, we don't typically yeah. negotiate on that cost. It's, yeah, I think it's, you know, uh, so I can say, so it's, um, um, uh, you know, anything that relates to their, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the exact language is slipping, but it's wages, benefits, and um, you know it's kind of the scope of their their job performance, if you will, is is bargainable. Okay. So we couldn't implement a body cam policy without their consent to it. And so if they don't consent to it, we don't get the policy. And so in a sense, you're kind of it's a quid pro quo. You're saying we'll pay you the one percent to get your consent to this policy, and I'm not. This is not at all a negative to the police union. It's kind of it's the nature of the beast. It's, you know, when you, when you go to the table with something that you want from them, you know, you've got to give something in return. And there's lots of gives and gets in the course of negotiations, but that's, that's a give in this case, because they can withhold their consent to that body cam policy. And I don't, I'm pretty sure we couldn't implement that unilaterally without their consent. So, okay. um, Thanks. yeah, hope that helps the answer is, but, um, we did have, um, you know, equity adjustments. And again, if you think about it, you know, in some ways it's kind of catching them up for where they, you know, where they weren't for the prior years, which were sizable this year. Um, we had equity adjustments for the fire, which I think were close to seven and a half percent, but the fire had not had an equity adjustment for seven years. That was, I think back to 2014 was the last time there was an equity adjustment. Uh, arguably they should have gotten one in 2017, I guess but it didn't happen. Um, uh, and so really going back seven years where they fell, I think in many of the positions at the fire department fell back to 18th or 19th position on the 20 town list. So it was a tough, tough comparison on that one this year. Um, with the police, um, they dropped 
which is again not atypical to I think number 13 on the um, 20 town list and so there was an equity adjustment of about 4% there. And there was uh, a few different equity adjustments at the library. Uh, most were kind of typical, but there were a, a, a few, a couple of positions in particular that it had gotten way out of whack. Um, and I think um, not necessarily because we fell behind because the marketplace just really um, escalated for those positions. We had the same experience in town hall um, where that particular position, which exists at both town hall and at the library, uh, just compensation for those positions, not just in uh, municipalities, but elsewhere, just skyrocketed over the last few years. And so you had to catch them up um, to where, where they should be. And, um, you know, I hope we're seeing some of the effect. You'd have to maybe Sue knows, but I'd have to defer to Tom and Michelle and Art. Um, I think overall, um, you know, I was involved with the police superiors, police patrol and library negotiations was kind of a fly in the wall at the fire. Um, I think, you know, not all started out great. They all ended up pretty great. And I think all were pretty appreciative of, of the town and the town's kind of approach this year um, to it. So I think we all went well. Um, as I mentioned, the TPW is kind of still in, in the process of uh, their negotiations. Um, I actually have a meeting Thursday, so I'll get a sense of where they're at. Um, but, I, but they haven't, I'm not sure they've met since before Christmas. So um, that's the bulk of it, I guess, from me, I don't know if you guys have any questions or if, uh, went too fast, said too much, or didn't say enough. So, <laughs> no, that was great, David. Thank you. So, does anyone have any questions? Or do you want to spend some time absorbing Andy's guy's hand up? Thank you, uh, David. That was really, really helpful and well, well, certainly well done. Um, the uh, uh, two questions, one is uh, where, where can we get copies of the uh, collective bargaining agreements mm -hmm. and the wage and classification plan if we want mm -hmm. to get copies? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, you, you know, Lisa Campbell, head of HR, has can certainly get them to you. Or I mean, if you ask, I don't know, um, you know, whether Tom, Michelle, or, or Art can certainly get them to you. They're all public documents, um, so she can get it to you. the the um, just you know the collective bargaining agreements themselves. The full agreements not it hasn't been fully signed yet. I mean, it's yeah. basically we do a memorandum of agreement, and that and it's just kind of cut and paste from there, putting it into the full. So we're kind of in process of of, of Lisa's actually in the process of kind of cutting and pasting and finalizing the actual contract, but she can get you the terms or the MOA or the contracts and certainly the, the uh, personnel bylaw and the wage classification plan. Yeah. The, the, uh, the minutes of the select boards meetings, when you have presented uh, the memorandum agreement to them contains a, a summary of, of uh, new provisions. Mm -hmm. And I take it those are, Pretty, pretty accurate and we can mm -hmm. just just look to those okay and the wage and classification plan lisa would have that mm -hmm. uh, as well um do you know who uh this this is an impertinent question but do you know who bargains on behalf of the school committee um for the school committee yeah it's yep. it's well there's they have they have the school committee itself has a um bargaining committee i know liza riley's on it um can't remember who else is on it right now, um, and they've um, uh, they've engaged um, um, a law firm represents them as well. It's um, I'm blanking his name. It's Toomey. It's I'm just totally oh, blanking his name. Toomey has the uh, yeah exactly. Yeah, you know, okay. we used to yeah. be town council. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. they've uh, been representing them. Do, do you know if they um, look to the same standards that the personnel board does? In other words the 20 town survey and the philosophy of looking to be just above the median? It's a great question. Um, I think they, they, they I don't, I'm not sure they always have. I think that we've certainly had a lot of conversations about it. And I know I, I, they've been certainly moving in that direction if they haven't, but that is, you know, a principle that we try to apply town wide. Um, some other folks um, may, I, I don't know exactly the answer to that question, Andy, but I know we've had the conversations and I know um, about it and how we approach it and trying to implement the same principles within the school as we do in the town. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, and and the, the final question I had is if I understand it correctly, uh, the wage and classification or reclassification plan uh, affects approximately 80 employees and uh, uh, the results is a overall uh, upward adjustment of 140 to $150,000. Is that? That's my memory about the dollar amount. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of an adjustment in salaries. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. That's all I had. And thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. George. Yeah. Thank you, Julie. Uh, hi, David. And thank you hey, very George. much. Great presentation. Uh, a couple of quick questions for you. Um, when an adjustment is made, and I'm thinking, I guess, in particular, the fire, because that was the most recent one you talked about. So um, there, they hadn't had an adjustment since 2014, I believe. And mm -hmm. so this, this adjustment is about seven and a half percent. I'm assuming that adjustment does not go back to 2014, right. but to some more recent date. So, Yes, great question, George. Great question. It does not go back. It's not retroactive. So the, the contract starts, the, all these contracts, I should have said, are effective July 1. And so uh, it's not obligated to, but typically you, you any of these increases are retroactive to that date. So with an equity adjustment, if we would take whatever their salary was from the prior year, we get adjusted up by 7.5% effective as of July 1st. And then on top of that, they would get the 3% raise. So when anyway, I say, I think it's about seven and a half for the fire. That's kind of across all the different positions. It's not each position. So it's across all of them. So it, it, we, you, you know, I'm gonna do my math wrong, but if you know, somebody made $10 an hour um, on June 30th and got a sit, they would get a seven and a half percent equity adjustment, which would take them to $10 and 75 cents if I do my math right. You know, that would be their starting salary, just their starting salary up to $10.75 as of July 1, 2021. And then you'd, you'd, you'd put the, the general wage increase on top of that going forward. But there's no back pay beyond July 1st. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. Um, and the second question is, um, you know, a number of the budgets that come through, as you can imagine, uh, you know, the supervisor or whoever is presenting the budget will say, yeah, I've got. I've got two openings, I've got three openings or whatever. And, you know, I just can't find, can't find people. My, our salaries are not competitive or, or whatever. And, and I'm just wondering that, you know, when you guys enter into negotiation, do you um, sit with the uh, department supervisor mm -hmm. and just sort of get a sense for, you know, what, what they're finding as they try to hide, find people? Yeah, we do. Um, certainly, we you know we will interact with those folks you know over the course of the year generally, and you know, here it's happening. But definitely, you know, um, at the beginning of negotiations, we talk about their challenges um, and what they're finding, and, and certainly we do hear that you know some of the challenges within um, you know the town just hiring generally right now, um, but within certain of the the departments, I won't get into I'll let them say tell you who's having the troubles, but certainly. <laughs> Uh, you know, a few of them have certainly said we're having trouble. And I think that kind of played into, you know, the decision, you know, which I think was right this year for the select board to go to 3% general wage increase um, and, um, and not kind of get into some of these other pieces that we often negotiate. But I think that was part of it to kind of bump it up a little bit um, beyond the 2% raise that the people have gotten for the last, however, six to eight years. I can't remember exactly. Um, but yeah, that's part of the conversation. No question. And um it plays into the tenor of the negotiation as well. I mean, you'll, you'll, you know, it's no, no doubt um, about it. So. All right. All right. Thank you, David. Sure. Tina. Thank you. This is so interesting. Um, really appreciate it. Can I just ask again, I just wanted to verify that are you, did you say that the, the wage change from this um, review that you did was around one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Like that's the total impact. No, no, it was. I think I was trying to say is that the equity adjustment. So the, the amount of the equity adjustment, if I remember right, is back in June, um, was about one hundred forty, one hundred fifty thousand dollars. So when you just the cost of bumping up the eighty plus employees to the median level of their paid pay rate. 
would be about that. That's not the go forward cost. I mean, obviously everybody got a 2% raise in um, um, as of July 1. And so, you know, I, I don't know the, the um, you know, if you look forward kind of the, the implication as Sue may know better than I, but, um, but my recollection, and I apologize if it's wrong, I can try and dig it out, but was it was in that range of 140 to 150,000 dollars because I think that's what I told the select board. So I hope I'm right for remembering right <laughs> that number. But that's the that was the cost when you go back and and say we need to make an equity adjustment because these X number of people are underpaid as of today. And so when you implement the plan and you bump them up to whatever the median is, that additional difference between what they were getting paid yesterday. On May 31st and on June 1st was somewhere in the range of 140 to 150 thousand dollars. If I remember right, it could be less. It could be like I can't going back eight nine months. I can't remember this afternoon, let alone eight nine months ago. But I, I think that's roughly correct. Hope that does that make sense, sir? It does. I'm just um, because we keep I'm, we've been looking at um, I've been looking at the fire budget and the police mm -hmm. budget, and there it's the budget increase is so large. And okay, everyone well, says, "Oh, it's the wage and classification schedule, and it's not one hundred and fifty thousand." That, yeah. that that's union contracts. Gina. Yeah, those are union. Yeah. What the wage and classification that David's talking about? Those are the eighty employees for the town, not any non-union town employees. Okay. So, so for so the town hall, basically. I, I, okay. So, so, so for the police, you'd have. We got, you know, I think it's roughly 55 plus or minus, you know, patrol officers and 13 superior officers. So, you know, say 65 to 70 officers, that's, you know, they roughly had a 4% general wage uh, or 4% equity adjustment. And, and it, it, it is, it could, it's big because it flows through them I and they have overtime and all the other stuff that it affects, you know, once their, their base jumps, it affects overtime and everything else and so it could be a big um it could be a, it's a significant number it is i don't know what it was is for the police like i can't remember what it was in the police department but i'm sure dave will present it or has presented it sometime okay thank you so much sure and we'll see those um a lot of those budgets next week so we'll be able to see all the budgets where you see um, a change in the uh, because of the new contract library and police and fire, et cetera. So, uh, Bob. Yeah, I had a question. Um, going back to article four in the mm -hmm. warrant last year, um, we recommended an appropriation of 463,454. And did that include the 140 and, and what was the balance of that for um whatever number was in there should have included the 140 yes um and um i don't remember if that's the right number or not so i won't i'll, I'll trust you on that but it should have included the 140 and the balance would have been anticipated increases in salary over the course of the year i mean sue may be able to speak to that better than i can um in terms of how she got that number uh, for a 22, Bob, it was yeah. 700. It was 700. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, it was like 705 or something for 22, not yeah. 21. Yeah, 21 might book. have been for that's what I thought too, Sue. Yeah, you got the wrong book. Oh, you're right. <laughs> I can see the color. <laughs> yeah, I pulled the wrong color. <laughs> And you need this color. And this basically what, yes. what, I, what I do, Bob, is I take all the salaries, take out any union contracts that are already in effect, because when they come to the budget process, they already have that in their budget. And then I take a 2% of everybody's budget. And that's what Article 4 is. So for next year, is it going to be a 3% number? It certainly is. Okay. So we can expect to see that increase in the Article 4 number for FY23. 
Actually, it won't be uh, much of, in fact, it's going to be a, a big decrease because all the union contracts have been settled. So everybody's budget's already going to have their um, adjustments already built in. Okay. It's, it's so going to be basically for all non-union employees. So, so the budgets with the union contracts are going to yeah. go up. Yeah. And, and the Article 4 amount uh, may actually go down. Exactly. Okay, got it. It's a good question, Bob. Anyone else have any questions? David, just uh, quickly about the next time that you'll be doing the um, the personnel board will be doing the uh, contract negotiations. We fall of twenty four for those uh, six unions. Um, yeah, they'll come up from twenty two, twenty three. Yeah, you know, they'll expire June thirtieth, uh, twenty twenty four. So yes, they usually, you know, we'll start talking about it probably May, June of 24. So I'm gonna make a little note for the, whoever the chair is at that time, <laughs> a little future note to uh, have ADCOM try to join in yeah. for any kind of, let's get everybody up to speed on, um, on the uh, negotiations and all that jo joint meeting with the select board. So, yeah, no, it's a great idea. I think, you know, as, as you and I've talked about Julie historically, we've done that. And I think it's always a good thing to bring everybody together up front, just so everybody's kind of on the same page as to where it's going and, and what's happening. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a good process. Caitlin, you had a question? Um, <clears throat> yeah. Oh, you got it. No, I'm, I'm, I'm on um, Trying to like fit the pieces in my head. So, Dave, when you are focused on just on salary, are you, do you take into consideration the increase in like health and dental and benefit and what what an employee may be seeing that annually as you're thinking about um, how we're increasing in salaries? And you know, I would and I don't remember the numbers. I'm just thinking like generally, are we seeing like healthcare costs kind of increase faster than? salaries and what we're offering employees in the town? Um, union is always very quick to point out to us the cost of health care and, and their individual costs. So, so it does factor in. Yeah, we have to think about it. Um, you know, we're always, um, um, union is always very quick to point out that we, you know, re reimburse employees at a 50% of 50% um, rate, whereas many other towns, the average town is probably about 69% right now. Uh, used to be significantly higher. And so, yeah, I mean, that is something we do here. I think one of the things um, we try to point out is we do look at the overall value of the contract and that we're providing to people as a whole. Um, and I think, you know, just for example, um, we had a long conversation in a few sessions with the police superiors this year, and I'll give Russ, Russ Khan the credit for really kind of driving it. You know, we kind of did an evaluation is if you look at, you know, your salary and you look at and again, part of it from a town perspective in, in, in doing these contracts is we're looking at the total cost of the contract. We're not necessarily saying the benefit to you, Officer A, is this much and the benefit to you, Officer B, is that much because everybody's different in their circumstances. But if we step back and we look and say we may be a little bit low overall in terms of the, the money provided to the union for health care, but if you look at other benefits like with the police, and I don't know if you're familiar with the Quinn benefit, the educational benefit the police get, and, and Hingham is paid full Quinn always, you know, with other towns or not. And if you look at the difference between what Hingham pays Quinn benefits to the superior officers versus most of the other towns, it's more. And so when you look at the overall value of what we're paying, we feel pretty comfortable that the overall value that we're giving you is, is competitive with the other towns, even though one may be a little less, you know, another may be a little bit more. So um, I guess that's a long-winded way of saying, yes, it is obviously something you have to think about. And if we fail to think about it, the union will remind us of it very and quickly. I, and we, so we do that with the same, with the, the AB town employees as, as we're doing um, in or is it, we do it differently? It's all, yeah, it's all, I mean, look, I think it's hard to, um, we try not to kind of get into the healthcare, you know, evaluation or discussion. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard. And um Healthcare is a whole. Not, I can have a whole other conversation with about healthcare, most of which would be honestly my own personal opinions, um, you know, and not the towns or anybody else's. But you know, healthcare is a really difficult topic to kind of get into, you know, when it comes to compensation and where folks are at. 
Um, and you would definitely, you know, you know, we definitely understand we're a little bit under, you know, what other towns are doing, you know, I'll also say, cause we've kind of been, been doing this for a long time and getting hit with it for a long time. If kind of leveled out, other towns are probably, as I said, averaging to my knowledge around 69% in terms of the average healthcare, you know, compensation rate. You know, that was probably a lot higher. Ten, I know it was a lot higher 15 years ago. You know, there were towns that were compensating at 99 to 100% of the healthcare costs. I mean, I had the conversation with our interim superintendent who was saying how in Plymouth they were almost 100% and they had to negotiate that down to 70 and the cost and the difficulty of doing that. And so I think, you know, um, it, it, healthcare is a tough one. It's just a tough one. And, and the challenge with it is, you know, once you agree to a percentage, you can't control it. You know, you, you cannot control the healthcare cost, um, but you, you know, you're, it's, it's, it is what it is, you know, whatever percentage or whatever that cost is, it is. Um, so um, anyway, that's whole, that could be a whole nother meeting, which may be a good meeting, but it's a whole nother meeting, I think, but it's, it's, it's a good question, um, but it's always in the back of our head, you know, when we look at compensation for all our employees. Yep. Great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think, Caitlin, if they ever did do that, it would be more town wide than just a particular union, because okay. it would be a, a payroll nightmare trying to figure out one subset of a union pays this amount and, you know, everybody else pays a different uh, percentage. Great. Thanks, Sue. Andy? I just wanted to follow up, Dave, on, on that. And when you're, and I don't, I don't mean to trigger a different discussion, but is it fair to say that when the union says uh, healthcare costs are up and you only pay 50%, other towns pay a higher percent, you don't, do not try to even that out by increasing compensation. You still maintain your standard uh, with regard to compensation, namely, these are the 20 towns we want to be at about the, the median, correct? That's correct, yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, well, there aren't any more questions. Um, this has been a terrific discussion. Thank you, David, for coming tonight and uh, really appreciate it. And we can all chew on this and this will help us um, in future discussions this budget season, I think. And uh, anyway, we really, really appreciate your time. Thank you. No, my pleasure. Anytime. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. So we do have a couple other agenda items. We'll try to get through them as quickly as we can. But next we have it, the um, sort of last run through of the advisory committee handbook update. and. Uh, the select board have pushed off their, I found out today that they pushed off their vote date for the gender neutral bylaw language. Uh, they're not going to do it on Thursday, but they may do it first thing at their meeting next Tuesday. So I still want to just do a quick run through and we could very well, we should be in, in good shape to take our vote on our handbook um, next Tuesday. But anyway. So um, I just want to take a moment to thank Brenda and Tina for your hard work on this project. Um, we really appreciate it. I also want to acknowledge um, the special role that Davaline Cooper has played in this process. Um, per annual town meeting in 2021, our Article 42, it was approved that the town's general bylaws would undergo an editing process to make the language and all general bylaws uh, gender neutral. So Dave Lynn Cooper was our liaison to that article last year, but then she went on to review all the bylaws and actually make the changes necessary to update them for gender neutrality. So she took on that big project for the town. It required a lot of detailed work. And uh, I just wanted to thank Dave Lean and acknowledge um, her contribution to this effort. You know, our handbook only has the little adcon bylaw, but that's really, uh, we really appreciate that. Um, the language went on to the town council's office and the select board um, is the last step, but I just wanted to say thank you, Dabling. So with that, I'd like to pass on the um, sharing to can, Brenda can I just or ask, Tina. Can, can, I, can I just oh, ask, yeah. David, 
Um, the, the planning board has a gender neutral amendment for the zoning bylaws. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that mooted by what you've done, David Lane? No, that, that was not part of the, the article because mm -hmm. they did not get to the planning board before December 1st. So the Warren article only dealt with the general town bylaws, not the planning board ones. They had said at that point, um, the League of Women Voters had said they would be submitting the art, which I know they have, and that's why there's an uh, uh, that's why there's the second step, I guess, is the way to put it. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That must have been a so, fun project. I think I'd rather drive nails through my hand. My goodness. It was a lovely project. Actually. Thank you for doing <laughs> it. Was, and it was um, it, it it was a good thing. It was a good thing to do. You ended up having to do a lot of it in the work that I was doing anyway. So at that point, if you've already done about half of it, it just seemed like it made sense to to volunteer to do that for the town, uh, subject to all those other other reviews. So thank okay. you. Sue, could you make Brenda um, a co-host so she can share her screen? So the question is, do you want to see the um, final version that we sent out to everybody to look at together, or do you want to see a comparison of that to what was existed in version 11 two years ago, from which we started? So you're all set, Brenda. Okay. She wants to see the edits. She wants to see the edits. Um, yeah, if you don't mind, just kind of quickly spinning through what we changed so everybody's up to speed on that. Nothing, not a ton, but. Some good changes. Right. Let's see if I can make this work. All right. So obviously with version 13, the date will be whatever date we finally do pass this. Revision history, you all have seen. We, we did the work last May of revising our rules and operations, uh, just never got it fully into the new handbook. So that was version 12, which never came to being on its own, but it was done. And then this is what we've done this year. A couple small wording changes here. So please speak up if there's something you'd like us to talk about. Uh, these were the changes that we made via the uh, warrant article this past May. So none of these are open for change at this point. They've been voted by town meeting. This is the new organizational chart that Tom Mayo and his group came up with. Everybody had a chance to see. Um, and here are basically all the different bits and pieces of comments uh, from gender neutral language changes to other language changes to try to make things as clear as possible. Um, is this the level of review, Julia, you had in mind or? Yeah, I mean, unless everyone says, forget it, I don't wanna go through it, but I just figure if you wanna scroll through just quickly and so you can see the gender neutral changes here in number five. Again, these are all the things that we did do last spring. So I think most people will recognize them who were on the committee last year. And other folks joined in. These are the changes from last year. Voted last May. And then we get to the financial policy worked on very hard by our subgroup this year. Uh, right, you can just scroll all through that because we already know that and we've already voted on that part piece of it. So, so that's just good. So, oops, this is the last piece of it. All right, so. Um, so here's our workflow. Mostly the changes here really are just uh, the gender neutral changes and the incorporating of our new titles of uh, uh, chair um, leaders, uh, separation between uh, for the non subcommittees, but the, rather the working teams. So this, this is the application of that. Change the select board. 
Okay, so again, the language of subcommittees versus teams. This is mostly changes in grammar and capitalization and I did a lot of work to try to get the formatting of the whole document fairly consistent because as you can imagine this has existed for 10 plus years with different chairs at <coughs> each year so the embedded uh, formatting was wild but we have gotten rid of most of the old embedded things so that now changes should be a little more straightforward thank you so, so the one change we did hear about was we misspelled caitlin's name so caitlin is now changed to a c rather than a k so. <laughs> and who was it who did all those formatting changes, Brenda? Uh, my IT consultant, aka my <laughs> husband, <laughs> who understands the. He's somebody who hates typing, so he will make changes on anything that involves less typing. So therefore, he learns all these programs. So. All right, excellent. They did Thank a great you. job. So, any other Thanks, comments, sir? Thank you. That the, all those little changes are a ton of work. I mean, a ton of yeah. detail. No, they have been. <laughs> Thank you. And Tina and I have gone back and forth. I don't know how many different versions. So it's been, uh, but anyway, it exists. Yeah. Appreciate it. And um, appreciate anyone have it. any questions or? All right. Well, then we are done with that review and we will. By hook or by crook, we're going to take that vote next week and we'll just get this off our plate. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be super positive about that. So we'll, we'll change the select board whether they do or not. <laughs> <laughs> I know. They just, whatever. They want to make sure that they've done their due diligence. So I understand. Um, okay. So thank you. So now I just want to run through some liaison reports and I'll start with George. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Brenda. I followed every word as you scroll down there and I agree with every change and every comma adjustment and every parentheses and everything else. So great job um, to you and Tina. Uh, so quickly, um, the Sustainable Budget Task Force is, um, is in the process of beginning their, uh, to prepare their report. Um, so I think they're going to end up um, laying out a couple of scenarios. I'm not sure they will actually make a recommendation, but they'll, um, they'll make a couple of scenarios and present that information to the select board. Um, but they continue to meet and, um, and they have started to um, to synthesize um, their thoughts, their ideas into uh, into various um, various position papers and things. So um, so that is going on, and uh, they uh, they're hoping to wrap up by the end of this month um, with a presentation to the select board, and uh, we'll see where that see where they end up. Uh, many questions or. Yes, Sandy. Uh, and George, uh, uh, is the task force aware of what um, uh, David uh, told us tonight about the uh, philosophy and, and strategy of the personnel board? Uh, good question, Andy. Uh, the task force actually invited David to come in and speak. Um, so he, uh, he gave us presentation very similar to what you heard tonight um, to the task force um, uh, probably uh, probably about a month or so ago. So great. yes. Great, thank you. Okay. Uh, anything else? Uh, okay. Um, and then you wanna take away, take aces too, George? Uh, I will. I will do double duty tonight um, since David couldn't be with us. So um, the uh, the school board, as I think we mentioned last uh, last time we got together, the school board has started to, to deliberate the budget. Um, it's been presented, uh, or at least the first part of it has been presented by the administration um, last Thursday evening, and um, and they're going to have another meeting this Thursday and then probably two more. Um, there'll be some discussions and deliberations between the um, the ACES uh, 
ADCOM subcommittee and the school board and the administration on the budget um, before we, you know, are, are certainly ready to present it to the rest of you all. Um, just um, on a very broad, um, broad brush basis, um, the administration presented a budget, um, uh, regular education of uh, $47.8 million, um, which is an increase of about $1.6 million or 3.38%. Uh, the special education, and that needs some special um, explanation, um, so just bear with me for a second, but special education comes in at uh, $14.7 million. Um, there's vocational education, about 175. So uh, total budget is about $62.7 million uh, at this point. Uh, and let me just go back to special ed for a second. Um, so, so I mentioned uh, a second ago that regular ed is up by 3.38%. Special education expense basis is up by 4.45%. And, um, but that's not the complete picture because there is, um, about a $1.3 million reduction in out of district placements. So if you were to look at the details of the special education budget, it actually looks like it's a decrease from last year. And in fact, it is a decrease, but it's a decrease only because there's a one-time only reduction of $1.3 million. Um, some individuals who are in out-of-district placement have now aged out of the system. So those expenses are gone. They're gone forever. They will not come back. But all the other expenses in special ed were up by four and a, almost 4.5% four this year. So that's something that we need to keep in mind, not only as we look at this year's budget as it comes to us, but actually next year's budget. So... Uh, so what the uh, what the administration is presenting is a budget which shows about a net increase of 1.43 percent, but again there's a 1.3 million dollar um, uh, reduction in um, one time only expense uh, one time only reduction in out of district placements. So. And George, uh, so, is it true that the 1.43 percent net increase um, is um, includes their their budget includes the ESSER uh, funds. Yeah, so the last, numbers that uh, I've given you are, not, are, are exclusive, exclusive of ESSER funds either for last, last year or this year. Okay. So for those who were around last year, um, the school budget was, um, there are, it was $1.3 million in ESSER funds. Um, uh, uh, what is that? Uh, elementary, secondary education, emergency funding. Um, so that, that money was available last year and there's money also available this year. And so the budgets will actually get reduced by that, those amounts of money. But for the purposes of the information that I gave you, I have yep. excluded last year's ESSER adjustment as well as this year's ESSER adjustment. So we're kind of looking at an apples and apples um, comparison. Okay. Um, so if, uh, if we were to look at, if we were to exclude that $1.3 million tuition adjustment, expenses for the schools would actually go up 3.64%. When we add in the $1.3 million credit, it reduces it to a 1.43 um, increase. So it's kind of a good news situation when you look at it and you say, oh, the expenses are only going up 1.43%. But that's not really the full picture. Okay, looks like we have a couple questions. Caitlin? Do. Nancy? Uh... I think Caitlin had her uh, hand raised uh, first. Oh, okay, she was fat first. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry, Caitlin. You're... Trying to be fair. Did they, um, and I haven't had a chance to watch the meeting, but did they talk about our 
is the increase like in the special ed, are we seeing an increased number of students uh, on plans related to the education loss from the uh, pandemic? Or are those additional services to catch students up in the general fund? Yeah, so we have, um, we have not gotten into that level of detail on that. So I'm not sure, um, I'm not sure where that money would fall, probably in a little bit of, uh, of both areas. And, and these would be the 32 positions that were added last year. Um, I should add um, um, that they are also, um, the administration has also asked for eight additional positions this year. Uh, some of those are in the central office and some of those are in the schools. Great, thanks. Nancy? Nancy. Nancy. You're on mute. <laughs> you would have no idea I did this relevant. Um, so <laughs> so um, I'm just curious about the this designation of the out of um, the reduction reduction in the out of district placements yep. being a one-time reduction. Right. I, am I Maybe I just don't understand the out of district placements as well as I thought I did, but isn't that a volatile number? Like it, that could be somewhat unpredictable, correct? That's, that's, that's correct. Have another wave of them next year and that would be go back up again, correct? Uh, there could be, uh, I think there's some circuit breaker kind of stuff that mitigates um, those huge swings. Um, and, and I don't know the details on these kids that have, have aged out, but, but I would guess they've been in the system for a number of years and they, they're out placement, out, out of district placement. I don't know if they're residents um, situations or, or they're just um, you know, daily commutes or whatever. I don't know any of the details on it. I just know that uh, the information that was presented is that they have now aged out of the system. So. Um, so it's not that they've returned to Hingham schools and next year they might again decide to go out of district. They're, they're completely out of the system. And apparent, I think that on the, the hearing this Thursday, I think the chair, Carrie Nee, is going to give a little bit more information related to that um, potential, the mitigation, uh, the circuit breaker, and, and I guess why they don't think that it's... Um, you're going to get a, a big out of out of district oh, placement again, again. But okay. that's why that's why I've heard that we'll we'll get some more information about that this week. All right, thank you. Yeah. But I, but I think in general, Nancy, yes, I mean somebody could move into town and require, you know, out of, out of district placement, and 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 there would be an increase, maybe not quite as much as this, but but there might be an increase. And, right. All right, thank you, George. Okay, uh, Bob. Bob? Yeah, George, did you say the total budget presented was 62.7 million? Uh, that's correct. <clears throat> and does that include capital? No, it does not. Okay, all right, well, that may answer my question. I, I am looking at the right book this time. <laughs> um, and, um, uh, the total education budget last year in Article 6 was 62.8 million. Right. But that included a million of capital. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah, so, we haven't yet received the school department's capital request. Okay, so that's going to be a substantial factor. But I mean, all in all, I, I would say that the numbers seem very encouraging uh, compared to past history. And, uh, and there may still be the opportunity to uh, do some value engineering to get them down lower. Uh, I would, would not disagree with you. Um, uh, 3.64 is, you know, versus the uh, historical rate is, um, is Really, pretty good. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm encouraged. Thanks. Okay. Andy. Uh, George, where does the the school stand regarding collective bargaining with the teachers? Uh, 
I don't know. Uh, I know they um, they post a lot of meetings and they go into executive session, but uh, I do not know where they stand on that. Um, uh, so. My memory was that they had concluded contracts last year that um, would go forward for three years and that they had in concluded them at a fairly um, beneficial rate to the town in terms of annual increases. Um, maybe, maybe I'm off a year, but I'm, I'm not sure that I think, I'm not sure they're in active collective bargaining negotiations at this point, are they? I don't think they are. I think there's just sort of ongoing uh, questions related to COVID and teaching during COVID, so. Yeah, I remember Michelle Ayer saying that they had uh, uh, concluded contracts that were good for three years, and I, I think they were based on a 2% uh, annual increase. Well, when I looked at it last year, uh, in our 20 town comparison that uh, uh, personnel board uses, we, we were number one in terms of having the highest salaries for teachers. That's why I asked. Yeah. No, that's that's where we're in the top three spots. Yeah. We're either one, two, or three. Yeah. And we know all the other answers to that too. <laughs> Which are I never got uh, one that I that, that, it gets in the student teacher ratio and, and there's like 20 factors that uh, compared from town to town, and yeah. it, it's it's not a it's not a one factor consideration. In terms of salaries, uh, I'm not sure I agree with you. In terms of town to town comparisons on other factors, I'm not sure I would use that 20 town survey as as, <laughs> as for the same purpose. I mean, you know, the per per pupil. Spending, for example. Yeah, there's a lot of nuance. <laughs> Pardon? What? There's a lot of nuance. Yeah. Exactly. And, and there's a lot of a lot of things going on, Andy. So that these may be topics for another discussion. Oh yeah, no, I I don't want to poison the meeting with uh, getting into that. We'll continue. Um, lots of discussions about um, the education budget and the weeks to come. So. We'll take it from here. Uh, thanks, George. Okay. So I don't have any, our, our two liaisons for Foster School um, are not here right now. Al had to leave early and Evan had a conflict. So we're gonna skip over Foster School Building Committee right now and that we're gonna also skip over Harbor Development. And Nancy, do you have an update on the public safety facility? But we got to get you, yeah. <laughs> I do. Um, so the public safety facility, um, the biggest thing that's going on right now is that the, um, the borings were, were, were done. It was a three-day project um, over for doing more boring and testing of the soils. And uh, those reports are being finalized and then they are continuing to work with Hingham Net Zero um, and who continues to provide input. Um, the big thing right now is they're recommending um, additional space and or equipment uh, be built into the existing desi design to ac um, account for future electrical growth. Um, going forward. So those are the two kind of topics of conversation right now. All right. And I have you down for Community Preservation Committee as well. So CPC la met last um, week. They have their eight uh, final proposals that will go forward. Um, it, or sorry, that are going forward to the, the vote. So they haven't finalized that, but it's basically that Habitat for Humanity Houses, the South Shore Community Pool, 
Um, there's two um, asks from the Hingham Housing Authority. Uh, REC has two asks related to the hockey court and the basketball court on Cronin Field. Um, the Housing Authority, uh, and the, I'm sorry, the Hingham Affordable Housing Trust um, has a request in and then the debt service related to the Lerner land purchase and the Ben Lincoln house purchase. Um, and their final vote, uh, which they're planning to do in one night is tomorrow night. Um, okay. If anybody is interested in watching that meeting that is on at seven o'clock tomorrow night. That's like good TV. That meeting is uh, always busy. Yeah, come with your popcorn, kids. Yeah, exactly. It's a fun night. <laughs> the former liaison, that was always like, oh, oh. <laughs> so um, very, very good. So I just wanted to add what happens after the Community Preservation Committee makes its final vote on what it wants to move forward to town meeting is that the CPC will have a joint meeting with the select board and the advisory committee to present to us the projects that they would like to advance to town meeting. So I asked about the date today and I don't think it's gonna happen. Uh, it's not happening in January. It could be the very beginning of February, but um, I'll let you know and we'll get that scheduled, that joint meeting. So I see questions. I saw Andy's hand was raised for a little while. Is that? That's okay, mistake. no, it's just now it's um, Bob. Yeah, Nancy, are there questions about qualification concerning the uh, housing authority requests? There, uh, that is still been a hot topic of conversation amongst the group. Um, there, I memory serves, um, Larry has asked the proponents to get a little bit more information. Um, it, it really comes down to these two proposals that um, they put forward. Are they maintenance or are they, do they really meet the qualification? No, no one disagrees that if they're not valid, good things that should be done. It's a matter of whether they meet the guidelines of, for CPC. I know that there was some questions put forward to um, my Clancy and the building committee versus some of the things that need to be done by the town that the town would have to approve, um, specifically as it relates to fire doors and improvements to fire suppression systems um, within the buildings and he was not available. So it's been kind of an ongoing thing. I'm assuming that they will come tomorrow night with more definitive responses to that. Okay, thank you. And if I feel like I'm kind of rambling, this is like every conversation that comes up in CPC related to these two projects. So. <laughs> All right, thanks, Nancy. Yeah. Uh, Tina, Tina has an update on Cleaner Greener. Um, just that they are submitting a warrant article uh, at Mike Puzo's request. They are a committee of nine and they've been having a hard time um, filling their members. So they're gonna request to move to seven members. And they're also on his suggestion going to ask to move terms to three years to try to um, reduce their turnover. So I just thought it, let people know. Excellent. Thank you. Um, okay, and Brenda has Climate Action Planning Committee. The uh, big piece of work that the Climate Action Planning Group wanted to get was a consultant to do their carbon inventory. Um, unfortunately, the MAPC said that they weren't going to be able to come up with a consultant for them until May, so they have instead put together an RFP looking for a consultant. That was posted at the beginning of December and they got no responses. So they are reposting it uh, now thinking that perhaps post holiday and whatever, but anyway, that they are a little bit uh, sort of stuck in the water until they can get the consultant on board to do the data analysis to sort of define where the current carbon footprint is. Because you have to know where you are if you're gonna bring it down from there, so. <laughs> But that's All the right. money that uh, that's to use. The consultant is paid for by the money that the light plant provided in the Warren article last year. So. Okay. 
Thanks, Brenda. Okay, that's it for our liaison reports. Um, I'm gonna go through this quickly. Um, I know it's the hour is late, but we have, um, we're heading into warrant article season. And I just wanted to um, just bring you up to speed on our process very quickly. We're, the warrant will close on January 20th per the town bylaws. Soon after that, ADCOM will get an electronic file with the list of all our articles and the text of each article that is um, proposed for town meeting. And I'm gonna assign articles to ADCOM liaisons using our committee assignments that were already you know, assigned at the beginning of the year. But I'm gonna keep an eye towards making sure it's a fair and a balanced workload for everybody on the committee. Traditionally, new members will be assigned the first batch of articles, which we call perennials. They're annual questions asked of the town that are very straightforward. As always, the comment, um, almost always the comment and recommended motion are the same every year. And it's just easiest to talk to the ADCOM member. The article was assigned to the previous year for any insight and direction. And it's also very helpful for members to review past year's warrants to read the comments. You can pull up um, many years of past town meeting warrants on the town clerk's website. Uh, you can pick up last year's town meeting warrant in print outside the town clerk's office in town hall. And um, uh, advisory committee has um, a whole set of written guidelines on how to handle the warrant article process conveniently located in the handbook that we just went through tonight. It's in section 7.3. So I'd ask that you please review them because it really takes you through the whole process. Um, so for uh, older members, established members, maybe refresh yourselves and then the new members uh, tells you exactly how it's gonna go down. So the text of the article, which is gonna come to ADCOM is the legal language, which does not change at all during the hearing process. And ADCOM members are responsible for writing the comment and the recommended motion. ADCOM members who are assigned to an article are going to speak to the proponents of the article and learn the purpose and rationale for the proposed article. If it involves expenditures of the town revenue, you're going to confirm that amount uh, with Sue and also discuss, if necessary, whether it's going to be borrowing or um, come out of fund balance. And um, if you're going to identify all points of view as early as possible, including, including opposing views in order for the committee to thoroughly get through this article and uh, look at all sides of it before we send a comment to town meeting. We have a document that we use every year. It's called the Warrant Article Style Guidelines. And I'm going to send that out again to everybody uh, shortly. It's a separate document, which just has the rules on how to write the comment, capitalization and what abbreviations to use for things, how to name the file. And we also have editors this year, like every year, who will check your written comment and your recommended motion. And this year we have Davaline serving us again, thank you. And we have Tina joining for our editing team. So we're gonna split up the articles. So some people are gonna send their comments to one or the other and, um, I just want to say thank you to you both for agreeing to do this important job. They're going to check to make sure that um, everything's written the way it should and um, is in good shape to get sent to the warrant. And traditionally, our vice chair is in charge of tracking where the articles are in the process. So George will be in charge of the WAS, the Warrant Article Status Summary Document, which I'm happy to unload that from last year <laughs> to George. But uh, it's not difficult stuff, but I don't know. I just, I, it was hard for me. But anyway, so each week we'll, we'll get a copy of the WAS that George will provide us that shows where we are, when the hearing is for an article, when the select board is gonna hear it. They always hear it before we do. Um, you know, whether the comment now is ready to send to the editors and then when it comes back to me for final review, when I then I send it on to the select board's office. So I'll go through that, that um, multiple step process again to remind everybody just as we get closer, but just wanted to tell you that there's just goes through the steps. It has to go to the editor, then back to me, and then it gets submitted to the town administrator's office. 
And then always please keep me in the loop on the articles. You know, you're going to be talking to the proponents. You're going to know, um, you know, where when changes are happening and um, just try to make sure it's going to be dynamic, you know, the, the schedule of what we're going to hear and when. So just try to keep me in the loop. So that's the very quick warrant article review process. Um, discussion of advisory committee housekeeping items. January 18th, uh, next week is our next meeting. We're gonna have the following budgets, fire, police, animal control, recreation, library, select board. The Harbor Master will be later, um, most likely, likely February 1st because Ken Corson is going to be out of town for a little while. And we don't have a date yet for the water company, but that'll have to get done sometime in February. Next week, we're gonna vote on that handbook. And then in the upcoming weeks, we will have some joint meetings for the select board for the presentation of the proposed CPA articles. And then we're gonna have budget discussions and some joint meetings with the school committee too. So I just don't have those scheduled yet. And then based on the select board's current schedule, I don't know if we're gonna have any work to do on January 25th because um, I'd hope to get started on the first batch of articles, the perennials that night, and I don't think the select board will have heard them that night or definitely not before then. So if you could just kind of still tentatively hold the 25th, just in case we really need to meet, but there's a chance that we might not have anything to get through on January 25th. So just FYI. And Anyone have any questions about that? So Julie, I just wanted okay. to say, I sent out, uh, Andy had requested when Jennifer Young appeared an accounting of um, the revolving fund and the, oh, yeah. the various funds. And um, so I did send that out to everybody. She's, she sent a very detailed <laughs> accounting um, that she uses. And so uh, if anybody has questions about that, if you get back to me, I can certainly refer them to her, but, but don't respond Thank you. as a group to the email. <laughs> Thank you. Andy? Yeah, I just want to know if other people are bothered watching that plant on the table behind you and whether it's going to fall off. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a round table. I know. It's, it's very firmly on that table, Andy. All right. Well, don't worry. That makes me feel just, better. See, it's not falling off. I can't see it. <laughs> okay. Um, Caitlin, do you have a question? Yes. Um, to actually comment on your background, Julie, I thought it was just like a screenshot of it's so nice. It's such a nice living room. It's beautiful. I literally it's thought my little cozy corner. I, I was, uh, I don't know, I was seeing into the future. I set it all up before COVID, right before COVID hit. Room writer, that, 10 out of 10. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, my two questions. The, where do we, do we have like a system where we keep like these warm files to make edits in or are we kind of doing them offline, sending them through email? Is there Kind of some kind of structure. Yeah, so you're gonna um, you're gonna get the text of the document uh, from the big document. You're gonna get the text of the article, and you just create a new like Word document, and then you're gonna um, the style guidelines will show you how to do like you know some things need to be bold, other things need to be a paragraph needs to be indented when it starts. It's, it's all in there, and then you're gonna save the file um, with a certain file name based on you know the articles that come out first they're going to be article a b c d um and then um so there's a certain way that we've saved the file and then you would email out ahead of the meeting um hopefully within with you know several days notice that we can um add com members can take a look we would review the article the the you know the rough draft of your comment and then you're going to bring that to um, our hearing and we'll go through that article. Okay, I think that's helpful. That, there's no like Dropbox where we're keeping them all. Everybody's doing it on their own and sending them out. Okay, got no it. No central so file. So it's transferred Every, by email. Everybody's on our own. Okay, and, and then my second question was um, last. I think it was last week. Evan mentioned potentially getting a. Um, 
a like cross-functional joint meeting together on Foster and get an update on that. Do you have any word on that or no? Because Evan's not here this week. Um, no, I think that the next step will be that the select board will want to speak to the Foster School Building Committee uh, right around or right before the deadline for the, uh, the, the warrant to close. And I know that they want to discuss the, um, the proposed project you know, and, and um, the timeline and all that with that committee, but it's going to be the select board that's going to ask that because they're the ones who have the authority to put the article in the, um, in the warrant. And uh, so it's not going to be a joint meeting right now, but obviously um, <clears throat> they bring an article, the school to town meeting this spring, then we're going to have plenty of meetings with the um, school building committee. Okay, thank you. Tina? Just piling on to what Caitlin asked. Why can't we use Google Drive for the articles? Because your editors will quit. <laughs> <laughs> At least one of them will. <laughs> but um, that I, out of curiosity, what is it that you, that you don't like about it? I mean, I, I'm, ge I'm genuinely curious because I it's just such a handy way to, to work. For me personally, I don't use, I don't, I have never used Dropbox, Google Doc. I don't, I haven't used them. So there's a learning curve involved that at this point in my life, the Dropbox, I'm ready to strangle everybody. So I think today I downloaded every file on my laptop into the Dropbox. So not, not the one that you all have access oh. to, but I think now okay. all my files are in Dropbox. Um, it's also what I find, it's not that every, it's not that every, the process of editing is that you edit and you're done and then you give it to me and then I'm done and then I give it to Julie and then I'm done. And so if you have, it's hard enough to keep track of what's the right version to have it where everybody can go in and start doing things will just, I think will make it overly complicated. That's my view. But I mean, you could do, you could, you know, you could go that route if you wanted. Um, okay, I, yeah, I understand having, yeah. I have such a hard time, <laughs> like this editing is so daunting to me because we go back and forth so much with all the versions that I end up, I guess I just need to get more organized about my version. The Warren articles are nothing like the handbook. <laughs> Right. That's a totally well, the different. torture that you went through is what the Warren articles are. <laughs> Tina, I will coach you. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, it's just uh, I think it's much simpler this way. Yeah, I see it's point so much mind. harder. But I'll, we'll persevere. This is not a good start when the editors kind of agree in the means of editing. Is... Well, why don't we all take a little time to think about it? We have a couple weeks before we you know, get into the thick of it. So if anyone has any suggestions or, you know, offline, we can talk and come up with something clever. So, um, but thank you for, thank you for your input. Uh, so then uh, matters not anticipated within 48 hours of the meeting. Daveline had a quick update on something from Capital at Life from last night's meeting. Yes, so I just wanted to let people know this came up last night at our meeting. Uh, our requests at Capital Outlay are already in, in um, far more than our actual tax levy part was last year. So I think last year, if, if I looked at the right book, um, and the right file, our tax levy budget was 2.275 basically. Um, right now we have requests in excess of $3 million. And that doesn't include the schools, which is usually, usually when we get the school request, it seems like it's the amount of money we have uh, so <laughs> that we've been allocated. So I suspect that will be a big number. Um, or town hall or GAR hall. So, um, so there was discussion last night about two different things. One was since our 
financial policy went from three to 6%, do we have more money? And I think Michelle made clear to us a couple of meetings ago that there wasn't likely to be more money despite that financial policy. Um, and, uh, and it wasn't clear where money was coming from. So, um, so that's an issue. And for people who are new, some of our capital requests are paid out of enterprise funds or like the Harbor Ways Fund. So there's, so I'm only talking about the tax levy part as the more than $3 million. But Michelle mentioned last night that she and Tom were going to be talking about whether or not some of the large capital requests should be Warren articles. So we may have some more Warren articles, like there's a, a lot of work that needs to be done at the Central Fire Station. Um, there's, I think, a, I think we have a request. We we're, we meet with fire next week, but I think we have a request for a new fire engine. So there's just some things that may, um, and I re, and so I said, well, I assume this will be really fast since it's the tenth or the eleventh or whatever yesterday was the tenth, uh, since the warrant closes on the twentieth, which got a little excitement from Michelle talking that she would need to talk to Tom soon to see what they were going to do. So I just thought I should let you know. Uh, there might be more Warren articles there, and and we'll see. All right, thank you. I'll follow up with Tom and Michelle at um, our weekly meeting tomorrow. So, thank you. And I okay. did, Julie. I went to that Foster School meeting. Yeah. Uh, since they knew me, they let me into the meeting. It was sort of interesting. They weren't letting everybody into the meeting, which I thought was really no problem but do they have like a limit on number of attendees because it, it was all on zoom right yeah it was all on zoom no it was that they they got bombed by a couple of people who were using other names and then they decided if they they were just letting making people stay in the waiting room i only know that because they had somebody who they knew the name and that person i think was maybe from the climate anyway they somebody said oh no that's so and so and they so they let them in um, so okay. <laughs> they, they apparently like to have in-person meetings. So, um, but they were saying that they, their plan was to submit a warrant article that would have language that would be a placeholder and it would be language sufficient for the MSBA. So I don't know. So I'll just throw that out there. They, they had a lot, they had a lot of big plans <laughs> and yeah, based. Yeah. So, um, Which in terms of doing something by the date. Yeah. Okay. Well, it'll be something to watch for sure. Thank you. So, all right, everybody. Thank you for your um, staying plugged in tonight. Appreciate it. And could I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Okay. By roll call vote, vote. Bob? Aye. George? Aye. Nancy? Aye. Dave is out of town. Evan is not here. Andy? Aye. Dave and Lean? Aye. Brenda? Aye. Kristen? Aye. Al had to hop. Tina? Aye. Matt? Aye. Caitlin? Aye. Sarah? Aye. All right. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you.